Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Richard Washington, and I am a program manager at the National Center for Victims of Crime. A few housekeeping items that I want to note for anyone who is new to the Zoom platform. The chat box can be used to send messages to the entire group, myself, or our IT coordinator. If you're having any issues, uh, there is an, a Q&A or a chat box at the bottom of your screen that you can use for any questions or concerns throughout the entire webinar. That Q&A box can also be used for any questions for our presenters. Uh, we will use time at the end of our training session today to, um, to answer those questions. We highly encourage any and all questions at that time. Any questions that we do not have time to address today, we will address using a follow-up email within a few days of the webinar. We will also be sending around an email after the webinar with the PowerPoint, the webinar recording, and a link to the feedback survey. I would now like to go ahead and get started with our training session today by introducing our two distinguished presenters. First, we have Justin Boardman. Justin Boardman is a retired detective and was in law enforcement for 15 years, all with the West Valley City Police Department. During these years, he's had a very diverse career. His first eight years was spent as a patrol officer in a very active city. In that capacity, he was awarded the Police Star, multiple life-saving, and other distinguished service awards. He was then assigned to the Property Crimes Unit for a short time, and for seven years, he was assigned to the Special Victims Unit. During his first year in investigation, Justin was awarded, awarded Investigator of the Year, conducted nearly 300 forensic child victim interviews and 140 adult sexual assault victims, um, uh, sexual assault victim interviews. Justin co-authored along with Donna Kelly, Utah Prosecution's Council, a trauma for victim interview protocol for adult victims of sexual assault. This new protocol uses the neurobiology of trauma to gain, to gain additional information to be used in the investigation. This process has been studied and has shown to increase prosecutions along with changes. Justin now presents and consults locally in Utah and nationally on a variety of different subjects. His focus is to strengthen investigations in a victim-centered, suspect-focused, and trauma-informed ways. I would like to thank Justin for joining us today, um, and we are delighted to have you. Our second presenter for today, David Thomas, is an IACP program manager, primarily focusing on projects pertaining to the National Law Enforcement Leadership Initiative on Violence Against Women, identifying and preventing gender bias in law enforcement responses to victims demonstration initiative funded by, the, funded by OVC, integrity action and justice, strengthening law enforcement response to domestic and sexual violence national demonstration initiative also funded by OBC and law enforcement in the communities they serve a supportive collective healing in the wake of demonstration initiative also funded by OBC Mr. Thomas retired from the Montgomery County Police Department in December of 2000 on full disability after 15 years of service he received his bachelor's degree from uh, Towson University, his master's degree from the University of Maryland, and a certificate in advanced trauma treatment from the Institute for Advanced Psychotherapy Training and Education. Um, so, um, Mr. Thomas, in addition to helping create the Domestic Violence Unit, he was responsible for the department's curriculum development in the domestic violence training, as well as the policy development on domestic violence related issues. At the time of his retirement, <clears throat> he was then the second highest decorated officer in the department's history, receiving numerous awards, including the Silver Me uh, Medal of Valor, the Bronze Medal of Valor, and the Policeman of the Year. Upon leaving the police department, he served as a senior advisor to the governor's office of crime control and prevention victim services unit at the domestic violence as a domestic violence specialist. 
In January of 2002, he signed on with John Hopkins University, Division of Public Safety Leadership, where he served as the program administrator for domestic violence education, as well as teaching courses related to violence against women in the division's police executive leadership program. I too wanna to thank David Thomas for joining us as well. Um, and I have personally uh, witnessed his presentation and I know you all will be delighted with it. With that being said, we're gonna take a look at our agenda for today. We'll start off with uh, Mr. Justin Boardman as he will go through trauma-informed investigations and, interview and interviewing. We will then move on to uh, Mr. Dom uh, David Thomas who will go um, into an overview of vicarious trauma you know, what is burnout? What are some burnout in the work environment and commonly reported sources? We would then go into Christopher Gibbons, who uh, is from the Cleveland Police Employees Assistance Unit. He will give a, pro a program overview. And then finally, we will end the session with um, a Q&A. Now I'd like to turn over the table to Mr. Justin Borman. Awesome, thank you for reading my obituary. <clears throat> Anyway, um, that was long. We, yeah, when you sit and you uh, listen to your bio and stuff, you're like, wow. Uh, yeah, I guess a little embarrassing a little bit. So um, let's get started. Um, today is the neurobiology of trauma. I know I need to share my screen um somewhere there it is share screen and i am not able to share my screen at this point so i'm sure they're going to be fixing that in just a second <laughs> not yet hey that looks familiar let's see what that does hey there we go cool uh, Okay. Cool, let's get going. Um, we're just gonna get started fast. I know that um, our time is limited today. Uh, I know that um, we have about an hour, hour and a half or so. So we are actually going to give you a lot of information and in just a split second of time, if you will. Uh, the neurobiology of trauma, there's so many different aspects and facets to it uh, that we could spend eons of time. What I've spent the last few years doing is trying to chisel it down for the justice system and particularly police officers and detectives. Um, so there's a whole lot of more information but this is probably the most pertinent information that you will need to apply to your jobs, right? So I didn't become a, a police officer to be a neuroscientist. So I've kind of chiseled it down into what I understand, which are usually four letter words. Um, so I also train by um, using as much humor as I can. Now, we all know that sexual assault, domestic violence, homicide, it's not funny. But what I try to do is to bring in funny antidotes and videos so that we can use them as analogies to more serious sort of things. Um, please ask any questions. Um, I guess we're doing that towards the end. Um, but you're gonna get a lot of information. Just to get started off, trauma responses are normal. So they're normal for me, they're normal for you, they're normal for our victims, they're normal for our witnesses, but they're normal biological um, responses to abnormal events. So something that your brain did not expect to happen. But these responses are all normal and there's a ton of different ones our objectives today are to um, learn the basic concepts again. We want to um, realize traumatized uh, people may have reactions that seem counterintuitive to us, 
from our trains, from our experience, from what we were taught way back when in the police academy. We want to learn how to recognize this trauma response in other people. And we also want to use this knowledge to benefit our victims and to build our investigations. Um, I'm sure a lot of you on here have had different trainings when it comes to the neurobiology of trauma. Each time that you hear one, you try to pick out another little gold nugget for your bat belt, if you will, or, you know, we've heard it all a million times, but we can take this one thing home here and there. If you've seen my presentation before, um, thank you for hanging through it again, and hopefully you'll pick up something else uh, to use in your practice. And then we also want to be mindful when we're doing documentation in our reports, uh, whether they are police reports, whether they're nursing reports for the nurses, or so on and so forth, that we document the details of the trauma in our police reports. So we're going to get started here. Um, this is actually going to be a little bit longer, but I want you to relax. I want you to be able to um, watch the video and laugh. This is going to be a series of events, um, a series of pranks, if you will. Scary snowman on the street. His head will turn, his body will turn, and people will have these reactions. They are normal reactions to an abnormal event. What I want and hope that you will see are, or is this moment in time that I'm gonna be calling the bam moment all day. So the head turns, you will see somebody quickly freeze their brain's going to decide what it wants to do because of this abnorm abnormal event. And they could freeze, they could fight, they could flee away from it, they may say something, and then their brain is going to, the gears are going to catch again and go, not a threat. And then they may laugh and swear and so on and so forth. But I want you to see this pattern. We're going to be talking about this pattern throughout um, the morning.
hopefully you were able to see where um, the head turns kind of go offline, if you will, and your brain decides which neural pathway to go down and they react. The brain catches because it realizes it's not a threat and then there's reactions afterwards. We're gonna talk about this BAM moment. So here's the problem. Victims, witnesses, people have a wide range of behaviors and a lot of them are not consistent and don't appear appropriate for that situation. And many of the behaviors and statements have been interpreted as lying or inconsistent. You know, when we were coming up at training uh, and we were doing ped stops out on the street and we were talking to people or we respond to a certain type of crime and people would lie to us. People lie to the police. And we would catch people in these lies by going after little inconsistencies and we would pounce on them and we'd go over them and over them. And eventually we would figure out that they were lying to us or they had dope in their pocket or what have you. And as we did this, we would see that they were lying and all these characteristics that prove that are actually also ways that somebody who's been traumatized can appear and present to us. Um, so it can be, can be a result of trauma. And we're gonna talk about a lot of that stuff today. That's been the main issue. So we're gonna go back into science. We're gonna go back a little bit into evolution. We won't go all the way back to the amoebas but let's go to cavemen because that's usually a good medium. So as cave, cavemen, um, we were walking, we were hunting and gathering and the world was full of threats from other cave people to the saber-toothed tiger to whatever else. Um, and we just wanted to survive. Our brains just wanted us to survive. And our brains were wired as such to keep us alive the best that it possibly could. So all sorts of things could come out and attack us. And we're gonna go into that prehistoric brain, if you will. Some people will call it the reptilian brain. Um, we're gonna call it the defense circuitry today. Uh, so we're gonna talk about two parts of the brain. We're gonna talk about the prefrontal cortex, and we're gonna talk, about, which would be the rational brain. And then we're gonna talk about um, the defense circuitry. And we're gonna get started with the prefrontal cortex, which helps us be rational. So that's the front part of the brain. This is the last part to evolve. We're always evolving as human beings. There's some generations and people not being born with wisdom teeth. You know, we have an appendix that used to be, um, used, it's not functional anymore. So we are continually adapting to our environment. So this area of the brain helps us be rational. And back in prehistoric times, um, there was not as much of this area of the brain. It helps us reason. We have a perception of control. Perception is one of those huge words that we're going to need to um, recognize throughout this presentation. Perceived control. We have thoughts and behaviors that aren't simply based on habits or reflexes. And this focuses our attention. Like right now, you're probably at your desk and you may have your headphones on and you are cleaning up yesterday's pile or last week's pile of stuff on your desk while you're paying attention a little bit off to the side to your monitor. You're focusing your, your attention. You get to choose to do that with your rational brain until an elephant comes crashing through the wall, right? And when that happens, you have this bam moment, okay? So we're looking for that bam moment. Of course, we know that Bam moment is not um, a medical term. 
<laughs> but it's easy to remember and it describes that moment pretty well, I think. But it's like a light switch. The moment when something goes from expected to not expected. And it can happen in all sorts of traumatic events, but not all traumatic events. But it's safe to say certainly a lot, and especially when it comes to sexual assault, it's over 50%. Um, so this BAM moment can happen several times during an event. So when that head turns on the snowman, bing, you have that BAM moment and they react and then they go not a threat but what if an arm shoots out with a knife out of that snowman and starts to attack them they could easily have another bam moment and this is what we train for in law enforcement we train for that bam moment we train for muscle memory when we do traffic stops we train for that threat um, we want that me muscle memory to happen to save our lives um, but we continually train for this moment. Our, our bat belts are set up for that moment. We even our uh, protection. So I used to carry a Glock. So the Glock is, you know, it's more of a point and shoot toward sort of handgun so that you don't have to mess with safeties or anything else like that. Because we know our fine motor skills when that bam moment happens, goes down. See what I'm getting at? So we've been trained for this moment. We just haven't been trained to recognize it in other people and what happens. So let's go out to the Serengeti, if you will. And we're gonna go to the watering hole. We'll go out and take a look at these Impalas. Well, you know, from I don't know, junior high science, we knew and we've been taught that the watering hole is a dangerous place to be. This is where predators come and pick you off, right? So if we look over to the left-hand side of the screen, you have a couple impalas partaking in the water, and then you have a couple impalas, if you will, that are looking on the outskirts, because we know the threats come from outside um, at this very dangerous place to be. But what if, at some point, the threat comes from underneath, right? Bam. That would be the bam moment. We look over to the left and we have one of these dudes that's like three feet off the ground. And you know what's going through his head, right? Holy shit. Um, so bam. Now think for a second. If we were back here, um, and then we have that bam moment. If all of a sudden that bam moment happens and our friend, the Impala here, takes a look down and sees the teeth come out and pauses for a quick second and just goes, wow, those are some big old teeth. He's lunch. So brain, the brain is wired to not rationally think just go to the defense circuitry to save your life. It doesn't matter how messed up you might be from the trauma afterwards. It just wants to keep you alive. So, bam. But that neural pathway is built because now the Impala has, has survived. So hopefully next time when it goes to the watering hole and that bam moment happens or the bubble pops up from the water, it will react faster and do the same thing that it did last time to survive. This bad moment happens fast. Um, let's take a look at this really quickly. Um, so maybe we will say that the cats are the hunters and gatherers and they're out hunting and then a saber toothed tiger comes in. It's a quick bad moment. Okay, we will go back to that bad moment because I messed it up. So it happens fast. Um, so the defense circuitry 
will hijack or impair the prefrontal cortex so that it doesn't rational think and it will do what it wants to survive um, and hopefully what has been trained. But sometimes this can happen with a little bit of warning. And I like to call it um, fawning or polite resisting. This is particularly the case when it comes to sexual assault. But this may also be witnesses in your crime scene to a homicide. It could be all sorts of different situations. Trauma is trauma is trauma. So it doesn't vary from one event to another. So I have to leave soon. My partner will be mad if you keep going. My roommate is home. They may hear us. Um, this could be uh, trying to talk somebody out of stabbing somebody or them for that matter. Um, don't do this, don't do this. It's called polite resisting. Um, in sexual assault, this is also the case because of years and years of social socialization for people who identify as female to be polite and not say no. They will try to find different excuses to leave that situation. Um, but as males, we do the same thing depending on what that situation is as well. So polite resisting. Sometimes people may submit and negotiate. I'll give you this if you don't do that. Hey, I'll give you the money if you don't shoot me, correct? So we can see where that starts to come into play. The um, defense circuitry, called the smoke detector, starts going, hey, there's something happening here and it's really uncomfortable. So let's do this later when the kids are asleep. Don't hurt me, I'll do it. I'll do this at another time in another place, not in the bathroom. So you can have submit negotiate and you can have um, polite resisting. And you'll start to hear that when people are talking to you about what had occurred to them or to somebody else that they witnessed. But here's one of the counterintuitive things when we start talking to people and very frustrating um, to us when we don't understand the trauma. Sometimes victims will recant um, or not participate in an investigation. As humans, we have this deep psychological need to return to normal after a trauma. So um, we want to feel normal after something happened to us. Um, if you get um, in a fight, uh, you want to, you know, start feeling better. Sometimes you might rub off where you got hurt. Um, you want to get back to feeling normal. Uh, and with domestic violence victims, you know, it could look like this was just an argument that didn't hurt me. Go ahead, officers, you can take off. I made them mad. Everything's good now. You guys can leave. They want to return back to normal. So what's happening in the brain during this bad moment is this. We're thinking with our prefrontal cortex and then that bad moment happens. A shooting, a stabbing, a rape, something happens like that. A car crash, an armed robbery, bam happens. So then that area of the brain gets impaired. It impairs. So what happens is the defense circuitry located in that area of the brain, which has the amygdala, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, all sorts of stuff, if you will. All we really need to know is this area of the brain impairs the rational thinking and takes you for a ride for a while. So the defense circuitry. So it can happen during sexual assault, physical assault, threats and attacks, but it's always scanning the environment, even when we're asleep. So it's always on the lookout for threats. Um, we look at people and our defense circuitry will judge whether they're a threat or not a threat just by their facial muscles. But when it detects a threat, it's gonna kick in. And it can vary from a split second 
to a few seconds before it takes over. So you saw when the head turned, just different pauses, right? So some were like quick, a couple had to sit there and freeze for a second for the brain to find the right neural pathway to go now. So it's a lot like a smoke detector. It's in the background and it's quiet until it's needed or somebody adds smoke to the smoke detector, it goes off. When it does that, it starts recording memories in a different way. This bad moment, a lot of times, um, will record memories in what some of us older guys call a flashbulb memory, because we remember flashbulbs. Um, <laughs> but it's a vivid memory of an emotional arousing event. So that bad moment, okay? So it gets your defense circuitry involved and it's why you remember these more clearly than others. Think about our careers or even if you, well, you can't get out of this career if you're a police officer without having um, traumas and PTSD. Let's just uh, put it right out there. But let's think about a, a traumatic event, whether it was a crash, whether it was a fight or something else in your career for a second. And those of you that are not in law enforcement, think of maybe a crash that you've been in or something that um, was very unexpected, even if it's your kid jumping out and scaring you, okay? Right when that bad moment happens, more likely than not, what you're thinking about right now is a flashbulb memory. It's like a Polaroid of an event. It's not a moving picture. That picture is filed in your memory under emotions and sensations. Okay. Emotions and sensations. And these are what your brain wants to remember that very highly accurate memory, because now you you've survived that event. And if it recognizes something very similar to that in the future, it will more likely than not go down that same neural pathway to keep you alive. So it looks like this. Let's say, bam, right here, okay? Something happens, big bam moment. Now your brain freezes, hopefully for just that split second. And it goes, okay, which neural pathway am I gonna go down? Well, I've trained for this event a hundred times on this, this passenger side approach to a vehicle stop. And all of a sudden now out comes a handgun. I've done this a hundred times in training. So we're just gonna go straight ahead on that well-worn um, pathway. And we're going to go into muscle memory and um, the defense circuitry is going to impair the um, prefrontal cortex and you just do exactly what you're trained and everything is good. But maybe this is not that. Maybe you go over to the right-hand side because this is actually, you're walking up to a house and the crap hits the fan. You've done a few trainings like this, but not a lot, not as many as you have done with car approaches. So now boom, you go over to this other side that's not as well worn out um, or worn in, but hey, you take it and you survive. Awesome. You know, maybe it hasn't recognized this before. It hasn't seen this particular event before and it tries something and it goes making its new neural pathway through the field. Um, and you survive. So now you've started that neural pathway for the future. But if your brain in that split second doesn't like any of these options, it may go into immobility and stay there until it finds an option that it might like. That's where it starts getting scary, right? We have a lot more of the freezes and the faints at that point. So when that bad moment happens, it can have this effect on memory. And it shows up counterintuitively. So what's poorly remembered are the sequence of events. Um, so we might be putting things in different orders. If we go back to the dude that had 
dope in his pocket and he was lying to you, you found inconsistencies and you pounced on them. But here, if they were traumatized, they're actually telling you the truth about what happened to you, happened to them. So events and details outside the perceived threat. Once again, this is a perception. So we call that tunnel vision. You tunnel into the threat, right? So now you're just focusing on that gun. Maybe it's the witness to a homicide just focusing on the gun of the suspect and not the suspect themselves, but the threat. Holy crap, he's got a gun. And we're asking for descriptions of the person. But the snapshot memory, more likely than not, is the threat, which would be the gun. What's well remembered, however, are the details most important to survival. Again, that gun, holy crap. Um, see, so when that pops up, right, um, what are you looking at? Well, you're looking at the gun. Um, a lot of people are not able to put together too much of the description of the person holding the gun because that's not the threat. The threat is the gun. And this picture here is recorded in your memory under emotions and sensations. So again, the threat of harm, emotions and sensations. So what did it feel like? Um, what did it smell like? What did it taste like? That's gonna be what this memory is recorded in our brain under. Kind of cool. So, wow, brain cramp. <laughs> There's not enough coffee this early in the morning. Um, okay. So, that's what we're going to be looking for is that bam moment. And then, you know, that bam moment could be something that they disassociated on. Okay. Now, dissociation, we could talk about again for weeks and weeks and weeks. We're just hitting the highlights and I'm more than happy to send you more materials and have you look at different places, but this is the stuff that more relates to the job that we do. Uh, so dissociation, this can be, be some crazy stuff. It's the brain's method of protecting us from overwhelming sensations and emotions. Let's think about this. Let's go back to caveman time, right? And we're walking down and we're hunting and we're gathering and so on and so forth. We're going down the trail and all of a sudden a saber toothed tiger jumps out. And let's say like the Impala, if I look, if the Impala was looking at that bubble that popped up and goes, that's a big ass bubble. I wonder what that is, right? You're dead. But maybe we go, wow, those are some big old teeth. And then we jump, but a little bit too late. And that saber tooth tiger grabs us by our leg, takes us down and starts to eat us. Your brain may dissociate from that pain because it doesn't want to feel that pain. Um, it protects you from those emotions like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I'm being eaten. Okay. And then maybe it finally takes off your, your leg at, at the bottom of your knee. And that's taking, that's making the saber tooth tiger happy for the moment. And you get up and you try to run down the trail. You don't want to remember that pain because um, it will keep you from getting away. Okay. So three features. Sometimes when we talk to people, they'll be blank and they'll be spaced out because of this traumatic event. They may feel disconnected from their body, which is really weird. We start thinking near-death experiences. Yeah, okay, whatever. Autopilot kicks in. We hope for autopilot when we've been trained to survive in certain ways. We depend on this autopilot thing. Um, that would be your muscle memory, right? But victims might report things like, I felt like I was in this corner watching this whole event unfold in the living room when two groups of people start attacking each other and there's knives and people are yelling gun 
it was like I was just in this corner watching. Uh, I was in a dream, or it was like I was watching something out of a movie. Okay? So this overwhelming sensations and emotions, your brain is trying to work with that. So this autopilot thing is extremely important. Sometimes, especially in sexual assault, um, people may go into autopilot. So if a victim is being raped, they may appear to be participating in this event because autopilot kicks in and they just want this event to be done. These overwhelming sensations, I, I didn't want this to happen to me, but they may participate. And that's certainly counterintuitive to us as investigators. It doesn't mean that um, this autopilot doesn't mean they weren't raped. They were raped. Their brain just kicked in. This switch to go from this BAM moment is something that we cannot control. So when BAM happens and you see this stuff after the BAM, we don't have that choice. Your defense circuitry has impaired the prefrontal cortex. We can't control that switch. So when that switch goes off, from our brain's perception, it is traumatized and it is doing what it can to survive. So it perceives that it was raped and it was raped, our bodies at that point, but it may not be the intention of the other person. So during the trauma of an assault, when we go out and talk to people or perpetrators and victims or witnesses, our perpetrators will have tunnel vision on what they wanted to accomplish, right? I just wanted to rob the store. I just wanted to complete this event. Our victims are gonna be terrified and overwhelmed. Our suspect is focused on what they wanna get done. Our victim's defense circuitry is in control. They didn't have control over that switch. Thinking is planned and systematic. Victims' involuntary focus on dangers, threats, and survival. So even if you're witnessing this stuff occurring. Perpetrator has a perceived control of behaviors and actions. Again, it's a perception. What if all of a sudden the victim or a witness turns on them and stabs them in the neck? They had a perceived, a perception of control, but now they don't. So they could also have a bad moment in some cases. Um, behaviors are controlled by emotions and reflexes, but the perpetrator is not traumatized. So they can put things in chronological order, which makes sense to us. And our victims are presenting more like the person that was lying to us before. So our perpetrator's account, right? Once upon a time, happily ever after. How did we learn how to read? Once upon a time, happily ever after. How do you write your police reports? You write them in, I responded on scene, I did this, this, and this, and I booked the idiot in jail, right? So we are used to this chronological order. That's how we communicate, but our victims, our witnesses that have been traumatized may have islands of memory and not in any particular order. So like the Hawaiian islands, right? So you might have a Wahoo here, you have, might have Mo Molokai and Lanai that are two little ones, then a Maui that's bigger than a Wahoo, and then a big island of Wahoo, and these gaps in memory all the way through it. It could look like my desk, right? And this event, this homicide are the pink sticky notes and they're all over the place. It's our job as investigators, it's our jobs to help them find those pink sticky notes. And it's also our job to put those in order. So to find those gold nuggets and put them into order. Our victims, our witnesses that have been traumatized can't do that because they're not in order in their brain. So that's our job. So 
a lot of times if you do have a perpetrator that's talking to you, they will give you the timeline. Our victims are going to tell you how that timeline felt. Okay. So um, officer involved shootings, you know, they have, there's a ton of research out there, especially by force science um, and especially in this day and age. But we know of critical incident amnesia. It happens. Um, but it affects our memory and our officer's ability to write a detailed report. In Utah, our protocol is to do a public safety statement and then re-interview the officer days later, because during sleep and REM sleep, you start consolidating memories and your brain will bring back out additional information. So after the first sleep cycle, the officer's memory increases by about 50%. And after the sl second sleep cycle, up to 90%, there may be memories that never come back. And that could be the same with our witnesses. And it could be the same with our victims. What happens, though, is a victim two weeks later may call you up and say, hey, I just remembered this. And you're like, what the hell? You should have told me that right at the very beginning. That breaks the case. Have you been, now you're just making things up to make your cases better. Not necessarily. Um, they may not have had that memory before, and it could pop up later. So now getting to the your body um, and what happens to your body. We've talked a little bit about what's happening in your brain. And let's talk about the responses to your body. We talked about that those pathways. We saw those pathways, that bam moment happens and we choose. So there's all sorts of Fs, okay? a lot of F words. Um, there's fawn, we talked about that. There's freeze, there's faint, there's fight, there's flight, there's lots of Fs. We're gonna talk about this freeze moment um, and faint a little bit more than the others um, because these are more counterintuitive to us in the field. Um, so it's freeze, the threat's detected, right? Options are weighed. That's your defense circuitry working. Super encoding begins. So we think of the watering hole. If there's no other options, you will stay in this freeze state until you find a better option. So we'll go to this news report um, with the deer in the headlights. This next story is all about a deer in the headlights, literally. Yeah. <laughs> it happened in Michigan when a deer ran out in front of a car, got caught in the headlights, and was scared stiff, really. He didn't move. Frozen in the road for nearly half an hour, holding up traffic, and then a sheriff's deputy was called, tried to coax the animal out of the road. <laughs> and when that did not work, he finally just picked the deer up <laughs> and moved it to the side of the road. Eventually, it took off into the woods, and we should know what the officer did. However, it is not recommended. But it's it's so interesting. It's like that classic deer caught in the headlights. That <laughs> is. You really that phrase about. means something, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with more world news now, right after this. So, that tonic immobility. Um, we saw the officer pick up the deer and take them off to the side, pat it on its rump, and it took off into the woods. How long was that deer out in the headlights? 30 minutes. That can certainly happen to human beings as well, although more rare when you're frozen for that amount of time. But it can happen. And it can create a whole lot of issues, especially in sexual assault. If somebody is raped at a party, goes into tonic immobility, and the suspect goes and tells everybody at the party and people go back and they're still in that frozen state, other people may follow with the rape. Then what happens when that person comes out of tonic immobility and goes into dissociation autopilot and now appears to be participating in this? See. It, it makes it very hard to prove, but they're not lying. 
certainly makes it hard on the criminal justice side, but people are talking the truth. So this immobility thing, um, there's tonic and there's collapsed. So tonic is a lot like um, possums, if you will. Uh, so the purpose is to preserve life. And a possum will go into tonic immobility because most of the predators need to have a bit of the struggle of its food source to keep the hormones going to continue to feed. So if the possum goes into tonic, um, it doesn't provide that stimulation for the coyote or what, who have you, and they will leave them alone. So the purpose is to preserve life. Perception equals reality. We keep on talking about that. It's not our rational brain going, that wouldn't have scared me, or I would have fought back. It's your defense circuitry's perception of reality. Perceived inability to escape. Um, maybe they were in the back room and they're trying to get out of this back room and I, there was somebody in front of them. However, there's an open Jack and Jill bathroom to the left they could have run through, but they didn't. So perception of an inability to escape and they froze in that position, even though they could have escaped. Um, a lot of times it's sudden onset, follows a failed struggle, pronounced verbal and physical immobility. This is pretty counterintuitive to us. Um, this can last for minutes, for hours was brought on by extreme fear. Perception is reality. So verbal, that is very counterintuitive to us. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. We've heard that before. Um, they're in a back room and being sexually assaulted, but there's people in the other room that could have helped them if they would have yelled. Hell, they could be in on a big sofa with a whole lot of people and somebody's puts a hand up a skirt and they freeze in front of everybody. Um, even though people would have helped out if they would have said something. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. Um, and then the physical immobility. So our victims, right? I was frozen, I felt numb. My arms and my legs, they wouldn't move. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. So you can think about that with witnesses to a homicide. Um, they may be saying the exact same things. And we go, oh, okay. And then we hand them a witness statement and say, write it all down. And they give us three sentences, right? If you go back to the officer involved shooting research and they have, they can't write a detailed report. When we are in a traumatic incident, our fine motor skills go away, which include writing. So we try to get victims and we try to get witnesses to write us a detailed report at that moment in time. That's why my Glock was set up the way it was, is big muscle movements, right? To clear the chamber or to drop the magazine to reload. Um, the only fine motor skill with the Glock was dropping the magazine with that button with your thumb but everything else was big muscle skills or big muscle, um, I'm missing the word right now, I'm trying to cram a lot in. Anyway, so we had to do all of that um, with big muscles instead of the fine motor skills. So you have this, this tonic immobility and we have this collapsed immobility, which is more about fainting. Um, so it can look like this. It can go back and forth. It's a sudden onset, but it's a gradual offset. So we saw the, the deer in the headlights once the situation changed, was like, hey, I'm good, and run off. This is a more gradual sort of offset. Um, but it has different things to do with heart rates and blood pressures and things like that. All you really need to know is all of this is immobility. But this causes wooziness, faintness, sleepiness, loss of consciousness, loss of muscle tone. 
So um, when I have more time to go through all this stuff, um, I'll talk about a foot pursuit I was in where I lost my legs. They just went away. Uh, which would be the collapse of mobility. Um, some victims may have stayed and slept over after the, the rape. Now that's been counterintuitive. If they were raped at 1.30 in the morning and they got up at eight o'clock in the morning and left. Well, if they got raped, why would they stay the night? That doesn't make any sense. However, if there's collapsed in mobility, they couldn't. Um, because of loss of muscle tone and the sleepiness that the brain's chemicals and stuff when that bad moment happens, roll over and fell asleep. So this is what it kind of looks like. This is one that I come with a, a warning on this prank. Um, so I'll just tell you about it and then we're gonna watch it a couple of times because um, it's mean and it's kind of funny, but you're gonna have fake blood and you're gonna have light, loud chainsaw. We're gonna look over at the guy working on the car. He's going to be our victim. Our suspect's gonna be the guy that's sitting down on the ground at this moment in time. What he did is he was sawing wood over on the side. And while he's sawing wood, he puts down that chainsaw and picks up another one without a blade, puts it to his chest, pops the blood pack and lays down beside his, beside his friend to see what happens. So loud chainsaw, fake blood. Yes, it's me, but it it shows what we're trying to talk about. Dude is out. Mean but funny. Um, so let's think about this in our in our brain for a quick second. Um, if this was a sexual assault victim, could you get the pants off our victim? Sure, you could get point A to point B. If the deer was wearing pants, you could get point A to point B. In this case, and you're interviewing our victim, or our witness to this traumatic event, what are they gonna be able to give you? I was working on the car, I turned around, bam. Chainsaw in the chest, how'd that make you feel? I felt helpless, I was scared to death, I didn't know what to do, and then nothing, okay? So they're gonna have this huge gap in their memory. They can't tell you what happened while they were out. And that can be very frustrating and counterintuitive to us especially because if this was a sexual assault, the illegal event against statute, the point A to point B, dude was out. He can't give you the details of what was happened. And then when he wakes up, he doesn't know where he's at. Um, back in the day, they used to train us in the carotid, right? So when we were being um, strangled out, if you will, um, a lot of times we wake up and not know where we're at. What am I doing here at work, right? And so now he's looking at the bottom of the car and different memories are coming back. Why am I underneath a car? And then my buddy's covered in blood and he's laughing at me. What's going on? So your brain's coming back online. It's only recording bits and pieces of what happened. Um, and then you just want to return to normal. Um, you push your buddy and you walk off to try to get back to normal and feeling normal. That's normal. <laughs> okay, so that is fainting with fear. Well, this can also go back and forth. So let's take a look here. Um, we have um, the female on the left 
She is going to be our suspect. The male on the right is going to be our victim or our witness. They're both experiencing the same, same stimulus of this swing, if you will. They're experiencing the same feeling. However, their brains perceive it differently. The lady is perceiving it as fun. The male is perceiving it as, holy crap, I'm gonna die. So we wanna think about this. We wanna think about polite resisting, which is not polite in this case, but it's more, I don't wanna, I don't wanna. However, he did get on this ride consensually, but now he's, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna. And then the bam moment and coming, going back and forth. Here we go. So how much memory are you gonna get back from this witness to a homicide? No memory is being recorded. <laughs> now there's some memories being recorded a little bit. Not anymore. Few more memories. So when we're interviewing that person, the bad moment more likely than not would be I was looking down and I started to fall. I felt my heart go up to my throat and I was going to die at the end, right? So he's not recording any memories. Um, and then we'll wake up partway through and go, Threat is still happening, shooting is still happening, stabbings are still happening, and go back out. So you're only going to get bits and pieces. Um, we're going to speed some things up a little bit. So flight, we all pretty much know what flight is, uh, but you flight while you flee, you fight while you flee. Um, and if you think you can take over the threat, um, you might fight back but we'll just show a quick prank here and think about the bam moment. Um, this one is we have the victim over on the far left in bed. Our suspect is down on the bottom right-hand side on the side of the bed. He's placed a mannequin head in bed with his significant other. Right? So what is the bam moment? You're gonna wake up and there's gonna be this person. That, that memory, more likely than not, is a photograph and it's gonna be infused by emotions and sensations. And then you saw her kicking until she came off the, the bed. So then you have fight and you fight while you flee. Uh, and you hyper focus on stuff. So we saw this at the beginning, but let's see this one. Right? Good punch, though. So <laughs> with the fight, the head turns, bam, our victim punches while he's trying to get away from the threat. That's going to be the bam moment. 
He's looking at the threat, tunnel vision at the threat. Do um, you see that he left the kid that over to the side to be eaten by the scary snowman? Fred looked and just focused on the threat. Um, maybe it was a stepchild, right? Just kidding, just kidding. Um, leaves the kid behind and then it falls over onto the other child that will have nightmares about snowmen forever. Awesome. So what we need to remember and think about is these indicators of trauma aren't reflections on credibility of your witnesses or your victims. And they may get more memories back um, over time as their brain um, condenses during sleep. So if we are not performing a second interview, a more detailed sit-down trauma-informed interview, with our victims, with our witnesses of these events, we are missing out on a lot of information that we didn't have before. And in those, in that information could be gold nuggets of, of evidence. Maybe it's even evidence that you can go collect for forensic stuff. Um, so I was in the corner watching. So their brain says I'm in the corner watching their bodies says, I tried to scream, but I couldn't. I couldn't physically get it out. It was like I was in a dream in a movie. My arms and my legs, they wouldn't move. I thought I was going to die. I felt woozy and faint. I think somebody put something in my drink. Um, I counted holes on the ceiling. Um, I felt like I was drugged. I just focused on the clock. My arms and my legs, they wouldn't move. So counted holes in the ceiling tiles. Okay, so the ceiling tiles above where this event happened, there, there are holes. Now that's something physically inside possibly the crime scene that we want to go in and corroborate that that's what they saw. So I've written search warrants for this dissociation and hyper-focus on the clock. I was raped at 2.38 in the morning. Can you tell me more about that and more about what that might look like? What did that feel like to you? And they may describe the TV that the clock was sitting on top of. What kind of clock was it? So if we get to a digital clock, so now we want a digital clock on top of a TV in our crime scene. So we could write our search warrant towards that. Okay. So using empathy and patience and tenacity um, is just more than worth it. We get a whole lot more information and we can retrieve this, this information over time. So um, we wanna work to corroborate everything that they're able to tell us about what happened, correct? Um, you might find more witnesses. So we can see this in, we have been writing about trauma in our police reports. You can start seeing it in um, news reports. So if you looked at this one, this is a, um, a news report out of a Kentucky school, and you can start seeing this. Um, they were talking when gunshots pierced the air. I blacked out, I couldn't move. I got up and tried to run, but I fell, right? Um, it was black for a good minute. I heard someone hit the ground. I just froze. Uh, it sounded like I saw a body drop to the ground. I can't believe this is happening. So sensations, emotions and sensations, I heard it sounded like, and you may get some great quotes. It sounded like someone's books hitting the floor. We've been in school when that's happened and everybody kind of jumps. We know that sounds a great quote um, I saw a body drop to the ground. So they can describe the drop to all of us right now. It's not diving to the ground. It was a drop. You get a whole lot better detail um, with the trauma-informed victim interview stuff. So it helps with the procedural justice. Um, 
let's see here, we're gonna jump through these. These are all hard cases, but we're gonna give you some of the basics and why trauma-informed victim interviewing is so important. So maybe these two people are communicating, they're at a party, um, they're talking back and forth. Then that bam moment happens. Something happens um, outside of their purview, right? The suspect's brain is the same as it was, but our victim's brain or our witness's brain around that event communicates differently. Then when we get out on scene, we communicate with our prefrontal cortex along with the suspects and people that weren't traumatized. Then we go and try to talk to somebody who's traumatized. You can see the problem, right? We're trying to talk cortex to cortex, which isn't working. Um, what we need to do is use the side door and talk to the defense attorney, um, the defense circuitry, not defense attorney, defense circuitry. So in that area of the brain. So we want to interview that smoke detector and it understands emotions and sensations much better. Um, but it can turn off if you start adding smoke to it. Um, and that could be done in so many different ways. Um, because it's always looking for perceived threats. So the key is don't make it mad. Don't piss off the smoke detector. It will shut down and you won't get the information that you need. So when we take somebody into an interview room like this, that's a victim or a witness, we know from experience that if we take kids into this sort of environment, we're not gonna get anything from them. You're adding smoke to the smoke detector. So we wanna approach these more similar to child forensic interviews. We want our victims, our witnesses, to share in a narrative form um, and to give details on their ability to recall what happened during that event. So we want them to keep talking. Um, yes, you're gonna get a lot of dialogue, um, but we want more information than we need and then it's our skills as investigators to pick out those golden nuggets. And then we can ask more focused questions after they've had the initial, the, the first um, long narrative. So some of the things that doesn't work for um, trauma-informed victim interviews are the who, what, when, where type of questions, and particularly the why. The why is very victim blaming and will put somebody on a defensive, right? Officer Boardman, why did you shoot that guy with a gun? Well, I get defensive really quick. He had a freaking gun and he pointed at me, right? Um, and so that is adding smoke to the smoke detector and I'm not going to be providing as much information. So if we have any sort of confrontation, you are giving that defense circuitry smoke to the smoke detector and it will shut down rapid fire questions sometimes we have to ask rapid fire questions depending on the circumstance but this is where the follow-up questions come in at a different time to re-interview because if we're asking rapid fire questions they are looking for those pink sticky notes of witnessing a homicide or being sexually assaulted and if they're trying to dig through their brain for that sticky note, and then all of a sudden we get impatient and we send them to another area of the brain, then another area of the brain, they will get frustrated and shut down and you're not gonna get anything. So we want to interview with genuine empathy and talk to people with genuine empathy. Sometimes that can be very hard, um, especially where you're at in your career and things like that. Although genuine empathy is the best way, sometimes we can get around a little bit, um, but not all the way. One of the ways that we can do this is empathetic eyes. And it takes some practice, but when you relax your eye muscles and your forehead muscles to be softer and more relaxed, that is going to add less smoke to that smoke detector. And you will see their um, 
their tenseness start to go away and they will trust you more and you're going to get more information just by working on that particular skill. We want to empower and give choice. Do you want to sit here or over here? As a witness or a trauma victim, your power and control have been taken away. Your defense circuitry took over. They impair, it impaired the, the prefrontal cortex. Um, somebody took your power and control. So it could be as little as, do you want a drink of water or no? Do you want to sit over here or over here? You're building trust. You certainly know about open posture. Active listening, being interested, nodding your head, doesn't mean interrupting. It might be a, oh, uh-huh, might be also active listening. You want to pay attention. It's not all about scribbling notes on a piece of paper. In fact, you probably don't want to do as much of that, especially if your interview is being recorded. Um, but maybe writing something down to talk about um, at a later point. But if you're recording, you have that tape to go ahead and review later. So a trauma-informed space. Um, Project Beloved is a nonprofit that, that goes around and helps um, build these sort of rooms for um, police departments around the country. But you want something more inviting, um, not more interrogative. Uh, you want to be sitting beside somebody, not right in front of them, knee to knee, um, like we do in some of our interviews. Um, so someplace soft and comfortable and private and safe. This also works with relaxing the officer. Even if you have to walk through a sea of cubicles to get to this place, once you get inside and you sit down and you sit down with your victim, it also helps you get relaxed and your empathetic eyes and their brain's perception of you is much better and they will share more information. So we need to interview our victims, our witnesses, according to their ability. We have been doing that with children forever, but if they've been traumatized, that bam moment has gone off. We have not been interviewing to their ability. So the trauma-informed victim interview, I'm happy to send to um, Richard to send it out, is a one-side piece of paper that gives you a guideline. It's a guideline. Um, it's not a protocol. It's a guideline. Protocols, you have to go word for word. Interviewing people is an art form. We don't want to take that away from uh, people. And sometimes if it's a protocol, it can be used against you by defense attorneys if you ask a question um, incorrectly or so on and so forth. This is the art of the interview. So it's a guideline. It's fluid in nature. Um, because, right, every victim in every case is different. So phase one, I usually try to calm people down with mindfulness techniques. Now, I think we're gonna go over some of those later. My favorite one is just taking a few deep breaths. It's good for me, it's good for them, um, but it helps promote a detailed statement. Um, yeah. And then I set the tone. So I introduce myself, I explain the purpose of the interview, is to gather as much information about their experience, not their story. Story um, sounds like they're lying. Um, I used to tell my ex all sorts of stories. Uh, it's about their experience. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you to, for being here. I'm here to gather as much information as you're able to give me about your experience. Able is one of those non-blaming because we know with the trauma, they may not be able to give us everything that happened to them. Think about the guy working on the car, right? You know, don't guess. If you don't know the answer, don't guess. Um, and also sometimes people are embarrassed and they feel like they've done something wrong or feel responsible. Um, I'm concerned about the crime that happened to you or that you witnessed. So um, certainly attending to their well-being, 
Um, I let them know that this is going to be a longer interview than we may have thought. Um, then we look for that bam moment. When we're listening to their narrative, we're looking for where it went from consensual to not consensual. Um, you know, even if it's witnessing, they didn't consent to witness this horrible event. So um, if they have a weapon focus, um, if they dissociate, that doesn't happen during a consensual encounter, um, even if it's a, a witness sort of thing. So we're looking for that trigger. Um, so where was the change? What did it look like? What did it feel like? And then we document, 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 and describe it. So we're interviewing around that bad moment and we work out to towards the peripheral. So if we think about that picture that had the guy with the gun pointed at you, we're working at that bad moment, the gun, we're getting that described and how they felt and so on and so forth around that moment. And we're working our way out. You know, this might be a sexual assault, so maybe to the forearm, a location of where this occurred. There was alcohol involvement, who poured, so see, we're going out towards the peripheral because that bam moment is the most highly accurate memory. And then we work out to where it starts to fade. So um, like that. But when we interview a suspect, um, you have your own ways to do that. But what I usually do will start from the outside, the peripheral and work towards the bam and go this way. Um, because if they invoke at this point in time, the bam moment is highly accurate from the witness or the victim and work their way out. A lot of times that will help fill in the puzzle pieces from both directions. So I want to help me understand what you're able to remember about what happened. And then you interview with silence. Again, we do that with suspects a lot um, because um, it makes them feel uncomfortable, but this way it's opposite. And um, they feel that information. And once they're done with their narrative, I wait for a couple big deep breaths to focus again, mindfully wise, but also to give them time to add more information. And it's usually better information after that pause. And then I'll go back and ask headline questions, which look like I want to know more about what happened to you in the back seat of the car. Can you think back to that for a minute? And can you tell me about how that felt? And with that pause, you help them have time to go find that pink sticky note to describe it. And we're talking about emotions um, and senses. And then the silence. Sometimes, and it's not trauma-informed though, um, we have to ask hard questions. Um, but we want to tell them why we're asking the question, and this is going to help a whole lot more and make it a little bit more trauma informed. I need to ask more about um, the weapons or why did this happen? Um, and I need to do that because blah, 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 blah. And then you'll ask the question. I know we're getting close on time. So threats and sensations. Then it's ending. You know, it's just, it's pretty easy. Um, so, Minutes of skillful support. Um, we want to um, explain the easiest way to um, get in touch with yourself, an advocate, um, the prosecutor, and um, how would they like to be communicated with in the future. So multidisciplinary teams, and I'm going to talk about that for about two minutes, and then I'll be done with the presentation. Um, this was more about our victims and witnesses. But what's super important about multidisciplinary teams and the way that we are looking at the future um, of policing is this communication. Um, I talk more about domestic violence and sexual assault. We've been very siloed. We will only share a tiny bit of information. We're used to as officers, we might ask a buddy to assist us here and there, but if we catch it, we clean it, right? So we're not used to a lot of teamwork. In domestic violence and sexual assault, that has not worked out very well for us. If you look at our numbers, our prosecution rates, how we keep victims and witnesses involved in participating with the system, it hasn't worked for us. 
Um, sometimes we might have to keep that tiny little bit of information close to us and not share it. But for the most part, we do need to be communicating with our team members. You know, when I would reach out to victims of sexual assault, a lot of times I would just do that through the victim advocate. They were less threatening. And the victim advocate would say nice things about me before they came in. Oh, Boardman, he's a good dude. Um, come on in, he's nice, he's not, he's not scary. But now you have somebody that's not law enforcement helping you out and helping you with your case. And we can delegate more to different team members to get some of the information for us, which will save us time, but it's also more, um, it helps keep our victims and our witnesses participating to the end. Um, that's just a short thing about multidisciplinary teams. However, the multidisciplinary team has helped increase prosecutions across the board on all sorts of different types of crimes. Um, and they're extremely important and they want to help. Um, we do need to help try to build some trust there uh, and try it a few times. And I think that you're going to um, have better luck, if you will, and better cases and people will um, stay involved much longer. Um, Richard, I think I'm, I am slowing down. Um, hopefully I kept it somewhat on time. That was great, Justin. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. I really do appreciate it. Sorry it was so fast. <laughs> just, just a quick reminder for everyone um, there is a QA box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, if there are any questions that come up from Justin's um, presentation as well as David's presentation, feel free to drop your question in the QA box and uh, we will open up a QA session at the end of this training. So, without further ado, I will turn over the table to Mr. David Thomas. All right. Hey. Let's see, let me share my screen. Okay, and uh, I wanna thank Justin for an incredible uh, presentation that was that was excellent. It's, it was a great precursor to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm telling you all, the, the to me, and I think Justin would agree, the most revolutionary thing that's happened uh, in my career, and I started way back in, in 1986, but the most revolutionary thing that's happened is this understanding of trauma and how it impacts uh, not only the, the communities we serve, but uh, our fellow officers. And, you know, recognizing it explains so much. And when I first came in, um, there were things that, that I just didn't quite understand when it came to the way victims present. Um, and understanding trauma really has gone a long way to, to, to help explain the wise and, and clear up many of the counterintuitive uh, beliefs that we in, in law enforcement uh, have had. So, you know, Justin, thank you. That was that was fantastic. Um, in my in, in in my piece this 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 morning, uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna focus on on uh, a little trauma a little bit more to. And, and we're going to play off a lot of what Justin taught you all. Um, we're going to go even further and talk about vicarious trauma, that we're trauma that we receive as a result or that we experience as a result of uh, having to hear the trauma of others. And then burnout and resilience. We're going to learn how... Uh, how working with as well as being a part of a potentially traumatized population affects professional staff. It affects us. It, it affects those around us. And we're going to look at look at how we can mitigate this, how we can and, and build resistance. 
Um, you know, as, as was pointed out in Justin's presentation, you know, the, that the good, sound, trauma-informed interview and knowledge of trauma uh, really results in more productive uh, information gathering. It allows us to see more clearly what, what's going on. I like to say it, it brings things into focus. Um, and these are things that were really out of focus for, for us, but we still had to trudge on not having this knowledge. Uh, it enhances victim recall, uh, reduces secondary victimization, and is victim-centered. Uh, the and you know this isn't to say that in the you know before this we were doing things wrong. We we were doing the best we could do at the time based on the information we had at the time. But you know what? <laughs> when you when you know better, you need to do better. We know better. And we are, we're, we're moving forward as a result. And, you know, we, we, it's important to, to know what trauma is. Uh, as Justin really pointed out, trauma, you know, it, it's, it's defined um, really as an exposure to something that's overwhelming uh, to the individual. And it's subjective in nature. Uh, what's overwhelming to me may not be overwhelming to you and vice versa. So that's something we have to recall uh, we have to realize also. I'm going to show you a quick video and then, then we're going to process it. Uh, and it, it's a traumatic uh, event that happens to an on duty officer. On an October night in Miami, Dominic Jean tried setting fire to an 8,000 gallon underground storage tank at this gas station next to Miami's International Airport. Surveillance footage shows the smoke smoldering as Jean grabs a gas pump and starts dousing the ground. It scared me because I thought, wow, we're going to die. That's Miami-Dade County Police Officer Mario Gutierrez, who happened to be patrolling the area, racing in, jumps out of his car, Ooh. hits the emergency shutoff to the gas pumps, then finds himself standing over a simmering time bomb, unsure if the gas tanks would explode. There would have been a massive chaos. Who, they would have thought it was terrorism. Who knows? They wouldn't have been able to talk to me because I would have been nothing but vaporized. Gutierrez tries stopping Dominic Jean with a taser, but it didn't work. Jean starts wildly trying to stab Gutierrez with a knife and a screwdriver. It came from my throat and I blocked it. Gutierrez falls to the ground. Jean viciously swings at him more than 20 times. That was a fight to the death and only one person was going to walk away from that. Gutierrez is stabbed about a dozen times, but he's able to briefly kick the man off just long enough to grab his gun, firing five times, killing Gene on the spot. I never heard the gunshots, never heard them. All I heard was the clinking of the shell casings hitting the ground. It all lasted less than 30 seconds, but dealing with the emotions hasn't always been easy. I felt like, um, like I failed. I, 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 I was... I need to know that I put up a fight, that I fought this guy, because I didn't remember. I had no, no, no recollection of it. So that really, really bothered me. These days, Officer Gutierrez patrols the Miami airport alongside his hero. All right, so who are these guys we're going to go see? You're saying Juan Leon, who saved my life. It was Officer Juan Leon who found Gutierrez bleeding on the ground that night. When I pulled up, I knew he was in trouble. His, his uh, brown shirt was completely covered. It was just red. De Leon raced his friend to the hospital just in time to save his life. He's my brother. Yeah. He's my brother. It's the unbreakable bond of officers on the front lines. <laughs> on an October. Okay, so um, did you notice uh, his recall or his lack of recall? And uh, you know, you can put your answers in the box, but what what did he recall? Oh, sorry about that. What did you notice that he recalled uh, during the event? What did he forget? You know, th this was, and and you could see that. Uh, how emotional he was, even though this interview was years later. You could you could see the long term consequences. 
So you heard the, the yep, you heard the sound of the shell casings uh, hitting the ground. You notice he didn't he didn't talk about hearing the, the, the firearm go off. Yep, somebody noted that. Have you seen similar, similar reactions in your interactions uh, with victims or with fellow officers, right? And did you, did you notice or did you recognize some of what Justin was talking about other, um, earlier when he talked about you know, going into you know, the type of phases we go into in a critical incident like this particular uh, critical incident? Those of us who have been in, in uh, shootings or those of us who have been in critical incidents, you know, this might even um, give you some flashbacks or make your heart. I know when I first see this, when I still see it, um, it causes my, my heart rate to go up a little bit, you know, and, and so forth because of being in similar type of, um, of, of things, right? And you see, um, Imagine, this is a trained officer, and he, he talked about his frustration with not being able to recall things, even this many years later. Think about how frustrating that's going to be for anybody going through something like this. Think about how it's going to be for, for a victim of a traumatic incident. And, you know, they think they should remember, just like uh, this officer thought he should have remembered, right? But they, uh, you know, sometimes we just don't remember. Uh, sometimes some of that memory never comes back. Um, much of it may come back over time after, you know, as mentioned, uh, a few sleep cycles, but there may be parts that, that the individual is never uh, able to retrieve. So, you know, in, in the work that you do, um, think about what's the biggest myth about your work or your area of expertise? What's the biggest myth when it comes to the job that you do day in and day out, especially um, that may be held by the public that you serve, right? What are some of the myths? And, you know, with the, the atmosphere that we're in right now where, you know, law enforcement is under a pretty, uh, a, a pretty big microscope. And, um, you know, we aren't all, <clears throat> we aren't always portrayed in the, uh, in the, in, in the best ways, which causes there to be myths about uh, what we do and what we don't do. What are the two, what are two to three of the most important things uh, about your job that you want others to know? What is your biggest challenge in doing the work, right? And what's the biggest reward for doing this work? When, when we think about these things, um, they're important for us to, to know about ourselves. They're important for our fellow officers to know, and they're important for the, the public to know, because uh, many of these the, these questions uh, are unanswered. Now, um, you know, Justin talked about, you know, the, the, the stress response. He, he did a phenomenal job of going through fight, flight, and freeze. Uh, most of us uh, are familiar with these with these responsive responses to a critical incident, um, and understanding this, uh, like I said, it's the, this is the most revolutionary thing that's come to, to law enforcement, really understanding and be able, being able to, to uh, realize the impact of critical incidents on us and on those we serve. Um, and it, it really helps us to, to do our jobs as well as our capacity to take care of, um, 
ourselves, our fellow officers, and, and, and the community. When, when we look at violence and we look at these events, it's, you know, as I touched on earlier, it's the subjective experience. In other words, your personal experience or that individual's experience of the objective event that constitutes the trauma, be it direct or indirect. Something, and, and realize, you know, trauma can happen from uh, you just witnessing something. Um, you can be a direct witness. You can be an indirect witness. There, are, you know, if you think back, many of us remember 9/11 and uh, those those towers falling. And there were individuals who were just as traumatized by that event, uh, living on the West Coast, as individuals who were at Ground Zero, because of their subjective experience, their personal experience of that objective event. Right, and because of how, what they perceived, you know, it, was it over? It's uh, is it o it's overwhelming physically, psychologically, cognitively? Um, do they feel like they'll be annihilated? They'll die? That's where we see. The more that we see that, the more the event itself is going to be traumatizing. Uh, so, and and it potentially does lead to tra traumatic stress and or um, post-traumatic stress. And we have to realize also that unresolved trauma can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. One thing we do a terrible job at, and we're gonna talk about it more, especially in our profession, is dealing with unresolved trauma the, 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 and the trauma that we see day in and day out in, in law enforcement. Now, um, we also have to consider for ourselves and, and for the, the community we serve, uh, the lens that we look through and the lens that others look through when it comes to the level of trauma they may or may not ha may have. Um, there are multiple factors that can imp impact one's ability to deal with trauma. Was it direct or indirect? How did it affect them? Are they also dealing with structural trauma, cultural or historical trauma. And to put this historical trauma in, <clears throat> excuse me, in perspective, we're gonna watch this, this quick video. Now this video deals with, with uh, trauma of historical trauma, historical trauma of African-Americans. And you know there, there are a lot of groups, understand I'm using this example because I only have 90 minutes, using this one example to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about historical trauma and how that can impact the way somebody looks at the world, somebody who may be a, uh, a direct uh, victim of this trauma or who, who may be a victim by way of relation because we now know that trauma can be passed on, the effects of trauma um, can affect our genetics. It can be passed on from generation to generation. So let's watch this video clip. In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant but as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, yes. we I'm descended sorry, into slavery. The, the institution shared. of American slavery developed as a permanent. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I don't think the video screen is being shared. We're still seeing the PowerPoint screen. Oh, jeez, it's not sharing the video? Yeah, it, in the, the Zoom settings, it might ask you to switch um, options. If you go to the uh, share screen. Okay, hold on. So should I optimize for a video clip? Mm -hmm. And then 
on that that square box, it should give you a couple of options. It should show like a small thumbnail of your PowerPoint. And then it should, if the video is being displayed on like your browser or if it's downloaded and you have it pulled up, you should see a thumbnail picture of that as well. Okay. All right, let's see if this will do it. Are you seeing it now? In 1619, when the first Africans You're were brought into the colonies by ship. Jesus, okay. Let me see one more thing and then I might just go on, I'm sorry. Is it is is the YouTube clip opening in a browser or is it supposed to be displayed through the PowerPoint? It's opening in a, it's in a browser. Okay, so then it should give you an option to see the browser um, in that share screen function, and it sh it should um, it should be there. Okay, PowerPoint. I don't see anything that asks about the browser. Uh, all right, I'm going to have to go go forward. I'm sorry. I appreciate you trying to help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Sorry about that. And and we can also share the link out in the post webinar email so people can watch um, at their leisure. Okay, that'll be great. The links the link will be is right there, and uh, and I'll be getting the slides to everybody later on. So th that basically was going to go through a uh, a a series of. Uh, that, that talks about the historical slot, uh, trauma uh, when it comes from, uh, when it, when it, with respect to the African-American community, slavery, and then up through till today and, and some of the, the events that are going on. And to show you one of the layers that some individuals uh, might be impacting some individuals and how when they're looking at a, uh, an event, that's part of the lens that they're looking through. So it's gonna be, it's gonna have an impact on the way that they perceive on their subjective view of what's going on. And so th those are things that we have to understand that, that if I'm looking at something and, and you're looking at something, we may not be looking at it the same way. That doesn't mean either of us are all right or all wrong, but it, it helps us to try to understand and take somebody else's um, view into account and understand why they may have come to a conclusion that they've come to. Now, let's see. <clears throat> the more predisposed one is to trauma, the more potentially damning the effects of a traumatic incident. A single traumatic event and repeated traumatic events can chronically elevate the body's stress responses. In, in, in law enforcement, we tend to be exposed to repeated traumatic events, as in other professions and as somebody who might live or in an area or be in a family where there is a, a good deal of trauma that goes on. Um, and tra trauma manifests on the body physically. Uh, we know that 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 many that there are many aches and pains and and physical ailments that are a result of the trauma experienced by the individual. Uh, it can eventually lead to serious life-threatening conditions. Cognitive function uh, can be impaired, affecting both attention and memory. 
Uh, this is important to note because for the people we are responding to, there's a good probability that this is not their first victimization. And they may be or have been exposed to a multitude of traumas. Therefore, it's going to affect, it's going to impact the way they present. Uh, and the more trust we have with the community, the more trust that we've built with individuals, the, the, uh, the more we're going to be able to work effectively with them and the more they're going to want to work with us. But where that trust hasn't been built, where, where those bridges are not there, it's going to be much, much more difficult. And that's why, you know, when we look again, what's happening today, it's, there's going to be different responses depending on the historical um, relationship the agency has had with the community that they're serving. Um, psychological trauma is an injury. Uh, and what we have to realize about it is that, you know, because it's psychological, we don't see it. And I guess because we don't see it, we don't take the time or put in the effort to try to heal it. You know, if somebody gets a black eye, uh, it's in plain sight. And uh, a week or so later, it's, it's healed and nobody thinks about it again. Psychological injury is something that's not in plain sight. It's something that we know, we, we need to know what to look for and what to listen for, right? And then we need to, to, to try to address it. Now, from the previous slide, we see that a small percentage of the population suffer the majority of the violence. They're frequent victims. If, so we, we have to know what to look for and what to listen for so we can put that in our, in, in our trick bag to try to uh, work with them in the best way possible. When it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, it isn't a given. Uh, many go through traumatic experiences um, without it ever manifesting to a high degree. But I agree with what Justin says said earlier, you know, you can't get out of this career without experiencing some trauma and some level of PTSD. I mean, for some people, it's going to be less than others. For, for some people, it's going to be off the charts. Uh, but uh, the more trauma one experiences, the more predisposed they are. Um, they may be more resilient than the next person. It could be one event that causes somebody to go over over the top. Uh, new studies have shown that police officers suffer symptoms indicative of PTSD at a similar rate of, of, of war veterans. Between uh, 19 to, to 26 percent of, of law enforcement officers exhibit uh, symptoms of PTSD to, compared to about 3.5 percent of the public. Uh, by and large, officers suffer from cumulative PTSD, and that's dealing with, with, with trauma day in and day out, again and again and again, and over time the buildup uh, can cause the PTSD. But trauma uh, can result uh, or manifest in other ways. Uh, one way is, is burnout. Burnout is manifest in a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. Uh, it can be caused by the demands of the work in high, uh, uh, work in a high stress environment. Uh, and it's a leading source of reduced job satisfaction. Across an agency, the greater the number of those experiencing burnout, the more toxic the workplace. And, you know, a lot of times when we see burnout, we see it because it's not being addressed. And there are multiple factors that can lead to burnout, including lack of control in, in work environment. And think about the, the job you do, how, how much control you have. The, the less control, the more um, we see poor employee health and morale. Uh, lack of empowerment to make decisions. You know, how, much, how inclus included are you in the decisions that are made about the job that you do day in and day out. 
And the more of these factors that apply, the more predisposed some, you know, that environment is to its employees burning out. Lack of collaboration with manager uh, and the team. So we, we, there's no communication or little communication, little or no supervision. Uh, insufficient orientation to the organization and the job. Uh, this is really, you know, a lack of, um, uh, of really explaining the job or getting into, um, into a, comfortable, a comfortable knowledge of the community uh, that you're serving. Everybody may not be familiar with the communities that they serve and the culture of those communities. Um, especially, you know, and this especially is true where we're, we, not, we don't, not only don't know the culture, but we're only going in for the negative. We're, we, we don't have positive interactions with those communities. Uh, work overload, un, unrealistic caseloads. Uh, and, and, you know, many, many agencies know work overload. Uh, the management culture is unfair. Um, there's favoritism, uh, no accountability, uh, you know, arbitrary promotions, lack of honesty, too much change, unclear requirements. We see this, we, we've seen this across the country. I know uh, right above me in Baltimore City, there've been, it seems like there's a new chief um, every six to, I mean, every 12 to, to 18 months, same thing in in, in Oakland and some other places where, where you see there, there's not an even, even leadership and this causes, uh, this makes it hard for the organization. Um, impossible uh, requirements, <clears throat> value conflicts between employees' core values and the core values of the organization. And this, this may occur where the, the values aren't talked about, they aren't discussed, there's no there, there's no ownership because the, the employees are never consulted to help to develop and enhance the core values. And insufficient reward. Individual feels like uh, they're taken advantage of, there, there's no recognition or little recognition, uh, and there is in, insufficient uh, compensation for, for what they do. In, in looking at, at um, the research on uh, on burnout, it it and uh, often and how it presents, uh, and think about think about you know yourself. Think about fellow officers, and and think about whether or not you've seen this. You know, delusionment by individuals or a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment, exhaustion due to the demands of the job and cynicism due to perceived unrealistic expectations and few resources. Have you seen this at work? I know I saw it in my job. I, I know I saw it in, 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 in family members who were on the job. Two of my brothers were on the department with me and I saw it in, in, in one of them. And the cynicism, I was, I was amazed. You know, I, I, I was a full-time instructor at our police academy for five years. And it was incredible to me how these, the, these rookies, you know, they, they come to the, uh, I mean, candidates and then rookies, they come to the department bright eyed and bushy tailed and, and uh, you know, going out to save the world, so to speak, and so forth. And then, you know, a year, two years later, they were, they'd come back to the, the uh, academy for in service and all the shine was gone you know, that they were, um, they, they were disenchanted, they were cynical. And as the years went on, they became more and more cynical. And think of, have you seen that? I, I think many of us who've been around, once again, for more than a half a second, have seen this, right? This is a part of burnout. And, you know, trauma is trauma. Uh, responding to traumatic events creates, can, can create cumulative stress. Well, it does create cumulative stress. Some deal with it more effectively than others. And uh, you see here um, how it can impact, impact 
uh, whether or not somebody develops PTSD. Uh, much of the research on, on this really began with combat veterans, especially after the Vietnam War. Now, due to the subjective effect of the event, um, you can't just compare traumatic events or reactions um, because of how some, some, indivi some individuals may not have as many layers of, traumatic, of trauma in their lives as others and therefore not be as predisposed. Some may have very little and still be affected, but it, it, it's subjective. If it's, but if it's experienced as a traumatic event, the reactions, uh, the PTSD reactions can, can occur. Bottom, but one of the bottom lines is that, you know, uh, being affected by trauma we bear witness to every day inevitably has an impact on us. That's why, you know, I think Justin said earlier that we all have some degree of PTSD uh, because, because and, and, you know, it's, it's going to be subjective. But this, but expecting to 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 do the work that we do day in and day out, and not be touched by the trauma that we that that we experience, is like walking through, you know, like expecting to walk through water and not get wet. So it's important for us to understand how it affects us and what can be done about what can be done about it. Um, you know. And, and what kind of preventive maintenance can we do? What kind of preventive maintenance are we doing? A traumatic uh, event can be more than just a stressor. Uh, it's a threat to one's safety, security, and sense uh, of well being. Now, cumulative stress reactions are less dramatic uh, and, and, and more gradual. They're usually related to low intensity uh, events, but are chronic in, in nature. Over the long run, uh, it can be as potentially toxic if not addressed. Due to chronic exposure and an inability to escape it, uh, or even the fact that the most rewarding work requires this repeated and persistent exposure to trauma, Frequent mild events, uh, mild stressful events can create high stress levels. Thus, they must be dealt with effectively and on an ongoing basis. Now, vicarious trauma is the work-related trauma exposure, right? Um, we respond in several ways to this exposure. Changes uh, of worldview appear to be inevitable and, and you know, that, that's what I was talking about by the individual who comes in bright eyed and bushy tails and in a matter of little time, you know, they're looking at things totally different. Their worldview has changed. Uh, and, but there can be a spectrum of responses to um, vicarious trauma, that, that, that work-related trauma exposure. It can be negative, it can be neutral, uh, or it can be positive. So we can experience reaction, reactions anywhere across the spectrum and in any direction. Um, we, we may be more one way uh, one day and more the other the, the next. And, and this is a different way of conceptualizing how we are impacted by our exposure to direct and indirect trauma. That's part of what we do. Vicarious trauma is simply the negative reaction to the trauma work. Um, the, ICE, the, the International Association of Chiefs of Police uh, has worked with the Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs to develop the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit, which can be found um, at the, the, the top website. Uh, the goal is for organizations to be vicarious trauma informed. Um, Proactively integrate strategies, proactively integrating strategies into the workplace, maintaining a clear vision that supports and articulates the agency's mission and regularly model and promote open and respectful communication. The research tells us 
that open and transparent communication provides a strong foundation within the agency. So it's important for leadership to provide clear information about the whys and hows of decision and policy making and to encourage staff ownership in these efforts. Leadership really should also foster a culture of openness across the agency, um, encourage the effective exchange of feedback and recognize the contributions and accomplishments, accomplishment of the, their, their workers. And you know, the impact of the work will tend to, be, to vary on us different depending on our worldview. Um, some may already have uh, a view that the world is unsafe due to early life experiences, you know, unsafe or unstable home, uh, violence, poverty, oppression, mistreatment. Uh, in these cases, there, there may not be a shift. You may already view the world as unsafe, uh, but there may be some cases where people um, had this, this Pollyanna, view of, of the world and, and, and it shifts as a result of what they witness. Now, the uh, pre prevalence of secondary trauma, it, it, it's high in, in the law enforcement profession. And, you know, the better screening, <laughs> the higher percentage is we're seeing of po po post-traumatic stress disorder. In other words, the, the more that we're asking solid questions about PTSD, uh, the more we're really drilling down and finding what's going on in the individual's life um, and talking to more people in the profession, the higher the level that we're seeing of PTSD uh, manifest. Uh, and I think, you know, if, if uh, because, you know, many of us, I, I, would, I would doubt that there's that, that more than, you know, that, that a large percentage of the individuals watching this webinar have been tested for PTSD, right? It's not something that we uh, routinely do, uh, but the more that we're tested and the more we drill down, the more we'll see there, there is some level as, as Justin pointed out. Now, risk factors for vicarious traumatization uh, are not limited to our personal strengths or weaknesses. Organizations who we work for play a large role in reducing our risk. You know, look at the, the personal risk and the professional risk there, right? Look at, look at these factors and, you know, mark down for yourself um, those that pertain to you and your organization personally. You know, is there any trauma history? Are there any pre-existing psychological disorders? Um, was there any exposure to trauma at a young age? Was there isolation? Inadequate, was, was there an adequate support system? Have you had a loss? Um, you know, it could be a, in the last 12 months. It could be uh, a, a parent. It could be a relationship. Um, it could be a kid going off to college. Has there been a significant loss? Uh, professionally, is there a lack of quality supervision? Uh, is, there, is there in the work that you're doing a high percentage of trauma exposure? Is, do you have um, an, a high degree of experience with the job that you're challenged to do? Uh, if you don't, this could be, this could, this could be a factor. Um, how, how matched up are you to the organization you work with? Um, is there a, a good deal of professional support? Um, how much orientation and training have you had for the role that you're, you're called to do? Uh, and so the more that, that, that the more checks we have for this being a risk factor for you individually, the more uh, predisposed you are for post-traumatic stress disorder and for um, vicarious trauma. Um, and, and here are some examples of the ways that vicarious trauma can affect uh, our personal life and sense of well-being. Uh, and, and you know, as we go, as you go through this list, think of how many of these may apply to you. Think of how many may apply that you know that apply to, to a coworker. 
you know, rapid pulse breathing, headaches, physically uh, impaired uh, immune response, fatigue, psychologically, feelings of powerlessness, numbness, anxiety, fearfulness, delusion, behaviorally, are you irritable, sleep problems, um, you know, staying away from family and friends, substance abuse, alcohol and drugs. Spiritually, is, do, do you have a sense of the loss for purpose? Questioning meaning, meaning of life. Cognitively, cynical, we talked about cynicism early. Pessimism, hopelessness, preoccupation, uh, traumatic imagery, and relational, withdrawn once again, or being clingy, mistrustful, lack of interest in sex, lack of close friends. Professionally, some of the examples can, can present in performance, you know, a de decrease in the quality or, or, or quantity of work, low motivation, avoidance or obsession with detail, uh, overworking, morale-wise, decrease in confidence, uh, in, in, in decrease in interest, negative attitude, uh, interpersonal, detached, withdrawn from coworkers, poor communication, behaviorally, absent, tardiness, overwork, exhaustion, irresponsibility, poor follow through, follow through, right? And, you know, when, when we look at all of this and, and as we went through all of that, what was it like for, for you to, to go through that? Did you notice anything? Did you, did, did, were, was there anything that, that affected you or do you think there's anything that, that uh, affects your coworkers? I mean, just 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 let that sit for with you for a while, and and because these are the, these are some of the ways, these are some of the things that we we all go to, but we go through that we all experience, but we haven't had a lot of intentional conversations about it. The space hasn't been created for us to do that, and so um, it it causes us to to you know when we hear all of this. And so it begs the question, what keeps you coming back? What keeps you coming back to the job that you do day in and day out to this work in this atmosphere? And you can put your answers in the chat. What keeps you coming back? Anybody, come on. What keeps you coming back? Providing hope, excellent. Meaningful, making a difference in someone's life, service to others, absolutely, absolutely. Many of those things that, that, that some of us uh, still doing good work, absolutely. Sense of purpose. Much of, of, of what some of us said when we had our interview, right? Why do you wanna be a, an officer? Right? Police work is like a DV relationship. <laughs> uh, serve others. I mean, there is a sense of minimize re-victimization, absolutely. So we're, we're still doing the job for, for many, many good re, uh, reasons. And it, it causes us to, to have to think about or things that we should be thinking about is um, and, and focusing on are what's, what's the meaning, uh, the successes we've had and putting things into perspective. Um, that's where, where our focus really needs to be. Um, it's about overcoming the difficulty of the situation and utilizing compassion and empowerment to achieve a positive outcome, being resilient, being able to get through and get past um, much of the, the horrors that, that we experience, much of the horrors that we've seen 
um, victims that we serve experience. Uh, and, and it's not easy. Um, and, and it causes us to have to really engage in preventive maintenance uh, to maintain good health. And it's really like, and, you know, we do a lot of preventive maintenance in many things in our lives. Most of us brush our teeth every day. That's preventive maintenance, right? Um, that results in better overall uh, wellness. The more preventive maintenance we do, the better. Most of us, I remember back, and I don't know if it's still true today, but, you know, we were, we, we had to, to, to take care of the, the PM, the pre preventive maintenance for the vehicle we were assigned, or we were in a trick bag, right? Um, our agencies did an incredible job of making certain that the fleet was maintained. We, as a, as, as a profession, don't do as good a job of making certain we have preventive maintenance for our most precious commodity, men and women who are serving, both professional uh, and, and sworn. We have to realize uh, what's important, that the neurons that fire and wire together uh, are, are what's important. Maintaining ourselves in the work involves paying attention to the ways that the work challenges us as well as satisfies us, right? Being taking the time to, to, to process some of the things that, that, uh, that are done. Um, some agencies are doing things like once a, once a month, they have intentional conversations about the, the calls that they've been on, both positive and negative, talking about uh, how it not only impacted them as a shift, as a unit, um, but things that they, they did right, things that, 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 that went wrong. Um, we used to do that after every call out as a SWAT officer uh, and a hostage negotiator. Every time we went on a call, a call out, we had a debrief and reviewed that thing, broke it all the way down, found things that we can improve, found mistakes, uh, deadly errors, and used it to go forward. We, we don't norm normally do that in other aspects uh, of the job. We, we have to uh, plug into and realize um, how we can protect ourselves, you know, focusing on the good stuff, bringing the good stuff up, because a lot of times if we don't take the time to do it, it's not brought up. Engaging in self-care, right? Uh, and so, so what does that mean? Well, it means uh, having the support of others, uh, both at work and at home, um, because this has been seen as essential in the response to vicarious trauma. Uh, being creative in ways uh, that absorb and focus your attention has been uh, really shown as a way to reduce stress and strengthen resilience. Um, eating healthy, at least most of the time, and getting good sleep. This strengthens our immunity and our body's brain function. So, you know, it, what are you doing to, to take care of yourself, um, to make, to invest in yourself? What is your agency doing to encourage, uh, to encourage this. Many agencies across the country are doing much more of this. I've seen, especially in the last three to five years at the International Association of Chiefs of Police at the, uh, inter um, our international conference, we have se sessions on uh, officer wellness, on this very thing, because we're finally realizing we're not taking care of our fleet of officers. And we're realizing we've got to do, we've got to invest in them. We're realizing that our suicide rate as a profession, as it's been for years, is way off the charts, right? And we have to do something, right? And so, you know, when in looking at the things that we can do to take care of ourselves, uh, we, we have to look at things that we can do for physical self-care. Right? I mentioned eating healthy, 
exercise and exercise doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and run five miles a day. Exercise means getting yourself involved in physical activity that you enjoy right, or trying to find something that you enjoy. I happen to, to still to this day, I, I, I like to run and I still do, you know, 15 to 20 miles a, a week. And, uh, and I used to be in charge of defensive tactics and physical training. And my thing to, to my fellow officers was when I was trying to develop a training schedule for them, it's like, let's find what you like to do. Do you like to walk? Do you like to swim? Do you like to bike? You prefer stationary bike, just find something that you like to do. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you can walk for 20 minutes. You can, you know, if it only, if it's only 10, you can work up to 20, but start doing something. But as you see listed here, getting massages, uh, you know, good sleep, take a vacation, psychologically, take time to reflect, write in a journal. Journaling is, is something that tends to be very therapeutic. Uh, get get personal therapy. Um, I also do needlepoint. Uh, it's for me. It's therapeutic. Um, gardening. You know all of these things. Spiritual self care. Find a spiritual connection in the community. Be open to inspiration. Be open to not knowing. Right. Mediate. Pray. These are things. Try it. You might like it. Uh, take time to put in the effort in relationships with family members, with friends, with your significant other. Um, in miscellaneous, you see here, um, <clears throat> mindfulness, uh, meditation, resourcing, gardening, music, whatever boats your float, whatever other outlets that give you peace. Um, it, it's really about finding what works for you. Doesn't matter what works for me. Find out what works for you. A lot of agencies now are investing much more so in, in, in mild, uh, mindfulness type uh, of sessions. I know in Oakland, uh, one, of the, one of the agencies that, that we have been working directly with um, at the ICP, we, um, we, we've been doing a lot with mindfulness. We have mindfulness sessions at our conference. Right, but they, they, this has been done in Oakland. It's, uh, they have sessions in LAPD. So be open to what might work. Give it a try, right? Um, what, what do you do to nurture relationships, both at work and home? Make it a habit. Peer support in our work is critical, right? Many, many uh, agencies now, or more agencies are, are having peer, some type of peer support units and, and really uh, taking advantage of what can be done in order to enhance uh, individuals' ability to deal with the job through peer support, deal with critical incidents through peer support. Uh, for many officers, it's much easier uh, after a critical incident to process through it with officers, with peers, who've been through life experiences and who've had training in peer support, uh, it's much easier to process through it than it is with the, with the, uh, the agency psychologist, right? Uh, and if, it's, if, if the agency psychologist works better for you, that's fine too. But we wanna give the officer as much, as much and as many options, especially options that work for them uh, as an individual. Um, formally or informally, the key is the healthy support and connection uh, among peers. Um, this is a major way that organizations can really support our resilience. Uh, some of the peer-driven support networks and assistant programs that specialize in working with first responders, you have the first responder uh, support network, um, out of the West Coast Post Trauma Retreat, the California Peer Support Network, uh, the South Carolina and Virginia Law Enforcement Assistant Programs. All of these have clinical oversight. Uh, information for these organizations can be found in the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit that I, I, I showed you um, 
that I showed you earlier. It's also important that, that we're honest with ourselves and that, that we know that, that we know our limits when it comes to uh, preventing vicarious trauma, that we develop ongoing strategies to deal with the challenges. This isn't something that, that you know, you're just gonna uh, you know, address once a year at in-service. This is something that should be ongoing. Once again, that's why I like giving the analogy of brushing your teeth. Um, this is something where we need to, 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 to talk about it and, and to listen to, uh, and, and listen to, to others, listen to our, our peers, uh, to try to work through it. Um, policy, policies on, in the organization should be clarified by leadership. Uh, we want to make sure that, that, um, you know, where, where we see, the, the more effective uh, procedures for combating vicarious trauma, we, we see that um, you know, there, there's a lot of openness, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of transparency. Um, there, that, there, there are officers uh, or agency members should be educated about the community they serve. Uh, you know, there, there are, we, we find in a lot of cases where uh, there has been excessive force, where um, there's misunderstandings and so forth, that the, the, the officers that are policing the said community um, have no idea about the culture of the community they're serving. That's a disservice to the officer to send them in there in the first place. We should be doing everything we can to make certain that we equip our officers with as much knowledge and experience as we can before just throwing them in. And that means if I'm gonna, if they're gonna serve that community, um, they should be knowledgeable of that community. They should get to know that community. And that, that means really um, getting out and being a part of that community. You know, when, when, when we work with agencies and we talk about community policing um, and, and I hear a chief tell me, I come into an, a department and this has happened, you know, where the agency has 900 officers. And I say, how many community policing officers do you have? Well, we have eight community policing officers. And I'm like, why don't you have 900 community policing officers? If, if we're gonna serve the community, we need to be a part of the community. And that means building, building that trust. Uh, and you know, in some communities, that's gonna be easier than, than others. Where it's gonna be harder is where we haven't tried in those communities where there hasn't been that effort in the past. Where it's gonna be a piece of cake is where this is something that's already been, been going on. You know, this, this happens in communities where we're not only you know, with our, our yearly um, evals, we're not only looking at what type of enforcement efforts our officers engaged in, we're also looking at what efforts did the officer during that, that, that in, uh, period, that evaluation period, what documented efforts have they made um, to have positive interactions with the community so that they serve? Uh, leadership should embrace and employ officer wellness strategies. Uh, and there should be transparency about decision making. Uh, leadership should be seen and convert, converse with the troops. If, they, if they're going to really be in touch with what's going on, they need to hear about hear it from the the boots on the on the road. They really need to 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 really and and because they they're the ones who can make uh, or at least have the ability to foster change uh, and effective change. And personnel at all levels should have opportunities to be heard. Um, th this is only fair. And you know, when it, when it, when we talk about what needs to be explored, once again, I'm really, I was really psyched to see that that you all that a trauma is being addressed. That that you you brought somebody with uh, with with Justin's. Uh, knowledge level of trauma with his practical experience. I'm telling you, the, the stuff that he said is golden. 
uh, ha being trauma informed, uh, getting the training, and then putting it into practice is going to make an incredible difference. Uh, investing in officer wellness um, is going to make a difference. Having effective policies is going to make a difference. And it doesn't mean, you know, some of the policy, it, a lot of times it means tweaking policy that's all, already there. Um, and depending on the agency, some need more tweaking than others. But uh, part of the, you know, this whole trauma informed piece is a common thread that should run through everything that you're doing, through all your policies, through all your procedures, uh, both internal and external. Um, and that's what trauma-informed policing is all about. That, that healthy work environment um, is something that should, uh, you know, that, that looks at health and wellness should be a common thread that runs through, through all that you do. Some agencies will even, when it comes to health and wellness and when it comes to trauma, they rate calls, uh, the, the calls for service that you're going on, that you go on. And after you re reach a certain score, you automatically, uh, people are automatically cycled through so that they can check on the officer, right? You know, a DV call might have a, a 60, um, a, 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 uh, a call like, uh, you know, a vandalism that occurred earlier might have, might have a 10. But the, the bottom line is the more that you have, uh, responded to more traumatic types of events, the more, you know, it kind of like comes up. And so that we can just independently check on somebody to see if they're, if they're doing okay, right? Uh, and we have to definitely have more ongoing trauma-informed resources and agency-wide training. This is something, I mean, I, I was taking notes through, uh, through Justin's whole presentation. And I've been doing trauma-informed training for law enforcement for going on 12 years now. We, can, we all can continue to learn and, and, and so forth. We, uh, and we, 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 met, we have to make sure that individuals have a voice uh, about what they need and what they want. And when I say have a voice, I mean it's two-way communication that we're, we, we're, we're saying what we need, what we want, and we're heard that, that uh, progress is made for those legitimate things that are needed, those legitimate things that are desired. Um, if, if they want us to do a better job, they, they need to give us the training and, and the tools to do the job that, that uh, they want us to do. And you know, part of this is going in, looking at our policies, looking at our procedures, making the changes that need to be made, filling the gaps, uh, and expand and standardize and continue um, what we currently do that's working, right? All right, so I finished a little quicker than I thought because I had some videos that I couldn't watch because we couldn't get them to upload, but uh, when you um, when you get the the uh, slides, you'll be able to go back and look at the sites to to um, to be able to upload the vehicle. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the videos, but that's my that's my uh, contact information, and uh, I look forward to the Q and A. Thank you, David. Thank you for bringing an awareness to, to trauma and vicarious trauma. Um, I appreciate you uh, joining us today. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the questions that our attendees have for you at the end of the session. So now I would like to turn over uh, the uh, turn over the mic to Chris Gibbons, who is from uh, the Cleveland Police Employees Assistance Unit. One thing we do pride ourselves um, as TTA partners with Project Safe Neighborhoods is not only giving you um, training and technical assistance focused on different topics, but uh, we also love to give you the tools to be able to apply those um, to apply those concepts to the work that you do every day. So this is why we are extremely excited to have uh, Christopher Gibbons on our call today. Chris. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot. This is good. All right, Eccles just said uh, his training is excellent, so I hope I don't do anything to ruin that. He's kind of a hero of mine um, on this job. 
<clears throat> and you know, I apologize for not being prepared. I I think I, I didn't get the email. I think I was listed as like Christopher Robbins or something like that. So I'm gonna have to spend the first half of this um establishing my street cred. I'm not a character from uh uh, Winnie the Pooh. So uh, anyways, you know, I got to check in on a little bit. I had another meeting going. Like I said, I, I'm uh, jumping in this a little bit um, haphazard, but I heard some of the two present presenters, some of the information they were sharing was awesome. Um, and really about the, the trauma that we're exposed to, you know, I, I try to explain it to civilians that, you know, they always talk about vicarious trauma because they get stuff secondhand but police officers get it firsthand, right? So we, not only do we take these horrific reports or go to these crime scenes that are just so uh, traumatic, you know, in their nature, but also we're victims of crime ourselves. I mean, I've been, had a guy try to shoot me. I've had a guy, you know, try to run me over. I've been in countless fights and all that stuff. And I'm not saying anything that anyone else hasn't been on, involved in on this, this panel here. Um, so we have the two forms of, of stress, right? That it, it's one is vicarious through the people we deal with. And then the other is like, I guess, primary trauma that we actually experience our, ourselves, you know? Um, so uh, I, I, I'm i afraid, I, I don't wanna repeat anything anybody else said. Like I said, I, I couldn't sit through the whole um, training and I, I apologize for that, but I'll just say that what we do with Cleveland Police, you know, uh, this department has really been, I believe, out on the front edge of this for a long time. Because um, when I first went down to, I went, I was in the sixth district and I left the sixth district in um, December of 04, I went to employee assistance. And at that time we were already like giving, we were allowing officers who committed suicide. We kind of recognized that it was sort of a job related hazard. And we were allowing them to be buried with a certain level of honors, you know, um, which I thought was, really respectful. <clears throat> we have, um, and, and we've always had employee assistance. We've always had people who are dedicated to trying to look out for the the trauma that officers experience and, and help them negotiate the issues that they deal with, right? So um, when I first got down there, I, I, I hated to leave the zone car. I really liked being out in the six. And I, I, I got down there, I was really overwhelmed by what, what I saw. I feel like we were kind of a mass unit at the time. And we were dealing with officers who were, you know, massive alcohol problems or DUIs or domestic problems at home, or, you know, even getting hooked on pain pills and other drugs uh, as a result of ways of coping with the stress. And, and all the things, the unhealthy ways that we deal with our trauma, we, that's what we were dealing with initially. And, um, and to this day do that, but we're, what, really what I wanted to do, because like I said, I was overwhelmed. I'm not really a keep an appointment kind of guy. I'm not really good at that. And my mind is a lot better for sitting in his own car and responding to what I see in front of my face, right? And so um, I was overwhelmed. I was more stressed in employee assistance than I was in the sixth. So what, what I decided in order for me to handle it better was to try and be more proactive about things, right? And to acknowledge all the things that, that both um, uh, of the presenters uh, mentioned earlier, right? So um, we, I, I met with some um, struggles with some of the other administrations. I'm not going to get into all that, but we really didn't have a lot of, um, they felt like, hey, we have people assigned to employee assistance, they can call, we have a stress consultant, which is great. A lot of departments don't have, we've had one um, from my long before I got on the job in 97, we've had a stress consultant and um, and they're great. And people, you know, they kind of learn the culture of policing and they can understand it a little bit better than maybe if you just went up to uh, the end of your street and went to a counselor and not to diminish anything that they do. But um, so what I think, um, what we started to do was to look around and, and I kind of wanted to change a few things like the culture is is you know, it, we're police officers. We know how that's top down, paramilitary. Cleveland is is maybe whatever, you know, we, we, we're we lucky in a lot of ways. You know, I, I think um, I really enjoy being a Cleveland police officer, but maybe some of the things um, until this administration, let me just say, there's been an unwillingness to really try more proactive stuff. And, and so this administration has been open to 
a lot of every idea that we've we put before them. So I'm just going to run them down. I don't want to keep rambling on it, and I'm, I don't know how much time I have. Maybe someone could kind of indicate that to me somehow. But um, so what we started doing was we instituted a few things. We I I really I just I wanted to do some kind of training, right? Some kind of uh, training that would um, allow officers to tap into what was within them. Because my belief is the officers have the wisdom within them. It doesn't have to come from the ninth floor, our ninth floor. Uh, okay, thanks, Richard, I just saw that. Okay, so I'll make it as quick as that, if not quicker. Um, the the officers have the wisdom within them. They, they put, we have to help them draw it out, right? Because they're so overwhelmed with the stress and the trauma that they're dealing with, everything that goes on in roll call, what they read in the newspaper, I suggest they don't get the newspaper, don't turn on the TV, don't listen to what people's opinions are. Pundits who have never had to put a 270 pound guy in a police car who doesn't want to go, um, don't carry a lot of weight with me. And I don't think that that should really occupy too many police officers' minds, like getting upset about something like that. So what we determined to do was to try and offer something that would help them engage themselves. And being like a civic organization, we had to be careful about like religious connotation and stuff like that. Not that we don't explore that, but as a program that the department runs, we determined that kind of mindfulness would be the most, um, we could take it with the most secular approach, right? So evidence-based, um, non-religious, trying, trying to stay as much away from religious connotation and uh, all that. What we wanted to do was to provide a format to allow people to, um, expand on any kind of uh, religious uh, background that they might have, right? So every single religious belief carries some type of mindfulness with it. Maybe you've seen your grandmother in church praying the rosary beads. That is a mindfulness practice. Um, Islam has mindfulness uh, beads. Same thing with Buddhism. Um, of course, the Eastern traditions are well known. So what happened was I came across a guy who was counseling a lot of our officers he had his own mindfulness practice and his program was pretty, I thought would be pretty palatable for police officers. And what, what we just did was we kind of dressed it up, tailored it to fit our population, right? So the, we brought, we presented to the chief. We said, chief, we would like to do training with um, the officers uh, to deal with some of the stress. <clears throat> he was totally on board. He was very, um, very open to it. In fact, I'll just to say that that he's provided tours of duty. He's allowed people to go on their off time and get credit for like um, working a day off. It, it's been really good. And I think that's helped to buy in. So we have about 1500 police officers. We're up to 1600. We're getting down closer to 1500 now. And we've had about 500 police officers join our training. So what that looks like is they come in, we do give them a little um, continental breakfast. We we start, um, we sign them in, then we we introduce them to mindfulness techniques, right? We we start to uh, uh, explain what they are, right? In a way that makes sense, we hope. And we we introduce um, breath meditation. We, we guide them through some guided meditation, some imagery meditation. We, uh, we do yoga. Actually, we start with yoga because yoga is a physical meditation that actually is designed to prepare your body for um, mental other forms of meditation. <clears throat> so the first practice we actually do is, is yoga and, and it's trauma informed uh, in a way that um, for, for our population, it's trauma informed. It's designed not to elicit any kind of a response. Because some of the, anyone who's practiced mindfulness can know that certain certain practices may may trigger something with people. Just being quiet for an officer can be a struggle, right? Just quieting their mind, a quiet room can be very intimidating because it's just uh, they don't like that. A lot of officers. So so we do the yoga. Then we do um, everything we do is trauma informed, um, guided imagery, breath meditation. Then we have lunch. Um, then we do uh, yoga nidra, which is another guided meditation. It's kind of like um, 
if anyone has done yoga, at the end of yoga, frequently you'll lie down, relax, be as relaxed as you can, and they'll, you'll be guided through a little meditation. This is very similar to that. But all through the time, we give officers a chance to, if they want to sit in a chair, if they want to sit with their back against the wall, we do whatever works best for them. Uh, they have the they have the wisdom. They know it's good for them. We're not going to tell them what to do. They get told what to do um, often enough, right? So the last thing we want to do. Something that we've been doing lately, it's really come up, is we're trying to introduce a little idea of like non-judgment, like non not judging yourself, giving this time of meditation to let go of all judgment and to say that I'm perfectly flawed. I'm perfect in, in, in where I am as a human being, as an officer. You know, maybe, maybe I make mistakes, but hopefully I learn from those. And then just to let that let that judgment go, because as police officers are judged constantly, something happens in Minneapolis and every one of us is judged on the basis of that. So um, that's something we do. We've introduced um, equine therapy into that. So now that the weather's going nice, we're going to go back out to the beautiful uh, horse farm out in um, Chagrin Falls, which is a community east of Cleveland, if you're not familiar with it. Beautiful community. We're going to go out there and we're going to do equine therapy. And if I can sort of explain this in a way that makes sense um, for us. So so what we do is the, the horse stands in on some level for ourselves and for the people that we deal with in the community, right? So to explain what we're getting at, there's a little method to this madness. It sounds crazy, but the horse is a big, huge animal, right? 1,200 pounds, giraffe horses are like 2,000 pounds. If they wanna kick me across the stall, they can do that, right? But what they pick up on is our energy because they're also, in addition to being massive, powerful animals, they're also prey animals. And they know that human beings are the top predator, right? And the top predator of top predators is the police officer who pursues the most violent within that group, right? So horses pick up on that energy and they can become a little skittish. And if we approach them with that energy, what we realize in that moment is that perhaps we're bringing an energy that might cause problems out on the street, right? So we learn to reset through some of these mindfulness practices that we have introduced. We reset, we, we get that energy down, we bring that energy level down so that the horse begins to approach us and do what we ask it to do without using any kind of physicality, right? Which doesn't work really well with the 1200 pound animal anyways, right? So, um, and, and so the horse, you know, in a sense is like, you know, like maybe that 270 pound guy that I just referenced earlier, as tough as he is, similar to the horse, he's riddled with fear. Like a lot of people don't know that, but these guys act out because they're riddled with fear. And so how I approach a scene can determine whether I have to fight him into the car or if I can talk him into the car, right? If I let him have his pride, Right. If I don't criticize them, I don't, I don't, I don't come in with my own crazy energy. You know, I mean, when I was long, young, I like to fight too, you know, and I, I think I brought that energy at times. And I wish I would have had these techniques when I was in the sixth district, I could have saved myself aggravation, I think. And so we, we use equine, equine therapy. The horse becomes a stand in for the people that we deal with. And then he's also kind of a stand in for, for us as officers, we realize our own vulnerability through this animal, we see our own um, may, maybe fear, right? Because it, it can't comes up. If I'm fearful and I approach the horse, he, he picks up on that immediately. So that that's something that we've done. And then so what during the COVID thing, we kind of had to pause a lot of these activities. We we even we even instituted like ongoing yoga for police, yoga and mindfulness. The police could just come in, they could drop in. We 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 secured a grant to pay for all this stuff. They could practice yoga, they could do mindfulness, they could come join us for free. We had classes that were strictly for police officers and um, we did it out at the park, we did it up on the lake. We, we, did all, we try to make it as um, enjoyable and relaxing as can be because this job is not very relaxing a lot of times, right? <clears throat> so um, that's what we've tried to do. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things. We've, we've done some other programs too. We can't get them into, into right now, but we've approached the department with some of this um, cultural transformation, which allowed 
officers themselves, I guess I can give you more information. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I can provide all the information they need on this. But allows the officers themselves to give feedback to some, um, some consultants that we had to establish a program whereby they could start to change the department. They could start from a district level, right? So that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing here. But what I believe is that for police departments, the police departments want to move into a more empathetic um, guardian rather than a warrior paradigm. What they're going to have to do is start to be more empathetic and compassionate to the people within the division, right? So I'll make this analogy, right? If I'm, I've got grandkids that live with me here, right? They're not with me right now. But if I'm trying to raise them to be caring and empathetic, if I'm telling them not to scream and yell, I can't scream and yell at them to get them to stop screaming and yelling, right? So if we're browbeating police in the academy, you know, we're humiliating them all through the academy, and then we're disciplining them, like, just relentlessly, we don't offer any kind of a carrot to the stick, what do we think is going to happen when they go out on the street? They're not going to be equipped with these tools. They're going to bring that exact same energy out to the people on the street. So fortunately, this ninth floor, our administration has started to recognize that that's true. They've started to change that in the academy and some of our end service and that they've recognized that this is really important. And so they've allowed us to do this to kind of say, I'm going to be a compassionate parent, right, as an administration. And so that I send out more compassionate kids, right? Maybe that's overly simplistic, but I think that kind of gets to the truth of what we're talking about here, right? So, um, you know, if I'm going to interview a, a witness or a victim, you know, I, I don't want to be browbeaten on, on, you know, 10 minutes before I get in my car to do that, I think. So we, as departments, have to change the paradigm. And that's what we've kind of tried to do with this cultural innovation program that I just referenced. And like I said, I don't want to exceed my 25 minutes. So um, I, guess, I guess maybe I'll leave it at that. I mean, I, I, if I think of something, maybe maybe I'll jump back in or something, but that's kind of a brief overview. Um, and then if you guys want to ask questions, I'm, I'm game. So what, Richard, is that is that fine? Yes, that's fine. If anyone has any questions for Chris, and in the unit that um, he is speaking towards, if you want to drop a question or um, a concern or any feedback in the Q and A box, uh, we'll open that up for the next couple of minutes, just for Chris, uh, just for Chris, just questions for Chris. Um, so we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to do so, and then uh, we will move forward from there. And Chris, so if someone was looking to access some of the services that your unit could provide, mm -hmm. how would they go about um, doing that? Yeah, so we, we, I mean, we have a city number, 6235678 for the local, you know, but I'll, I'm going to share I'll, my um, cell phone. If anyone wants to call me about this stuff, I'll give them to 216-857-7330 because, um, and, and I could explain more in detail or, you know, we can talk about it, have a coffee here, I can share some of the links with people, but um, they would just call us. We're trying to really get out there. We're trying to stay in front of the people. We we talk to all the in-services. We talk, well, I'm, we're putting together a video so we can speak to every in-service. It would be a nightmare to try and do that. But we have spoken to all the in-services in the past. We talk to the academy recruits. We take every academy class through our mindfulness training. So we introduce them not only to us, but also to the practices that we're talking about here. So we, we try and get our, our name out there. We, we We've tried to really put this stuff out in the media to let them know, look at police officers recognize that, you know, we're not perfect and that we're working on this stuff, right? But the media doesn't really, I'm just going to say they don't want to hear that story at this point. It just seems to me, they don't want to hear that police officers themselves are taking this up upon themselves to say, we're going to prove our service to you, the community, by addressing within ourselves what might be going on, right? So um, that's just, I'm just putting that out there. I'm just just say it honestly. We've we've met some dead ends when we try and communicate this on a larger level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any questions for you, Chris. Can you just um, uh, recite your phone number one more time? I'll put it in the chat for mm -hmm. uh, folks that may be interested in the services. 
Yeah, 216-857-7330. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Perfect. And thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Um, of course, we will be sharing um, any information uh, that Chris wants to uh, share with you guys via our um, email that will go out after the webinar. Uh, mm -hmm. So look forward for more information from Chris. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll share some links and everything, whatever, they're, whatever they're looking for. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. All right, before we move into our Q&A session for our presenters today, um, we'll take a quick five minute break at that time. Um, if anyone has any questions for our presenters, this would be the appropriate time to drop those in the uh, Q&A box below. So we'll give everybody about um, three to five minutes of a quick break um, and we'll come back and finish up our training today with the Q&A session. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start our Q&A session. I would like to turn over the table to uh, Rachel Gibson, Director at the National Center for Victims of Crime, who will facilitate this session. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Richard, and thank you to our wonderful presenters. I've learned so much, and I know folks have some really good questions, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our first question is, this person um, said that they've read a lot about how trauma affects law enforcement. They're thinking about what agencies can do to support the prevention of secondary trauma. What do you think we need to say to leadership about steps that can be taken? And I think that question can be posed to any of our panelists. We're all- well, too Go to ahead, in. Jeff, Justin. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I, I don't think there's uh, any way that we can avoid trauma, but I think the best thing we could do is uh, is to it, give officers the tools that they, they need to, to deal with that trauma when it comes up. So, um, you know, certainly mindfulness um, is, is a really good one. 
I, I think some agency within the department too helps too that their voices are heard, you know, to really support officers within the division um, leadership. And I, I know sometimes this can be tough, you know, leaders are in a tough position politically, you know, they say things that it, it can be tough. We've been lucky, I think, you know, for the most part, our um, our chief has, has said some some positive things for us in the past that it helps. I think, you know, awards programs, recognition, just constantly recognize officers for what they're doing is really important. It helps to deal with some of the trauma. And, and I just want to say one quick thing about trauma. I've been doing a little research into it. Uh, there's a little phenomenon called uh, post-traumatic recovery, which some of this, some of this, indicates that not only can people, people can actually be better after, more integrated, more whole after trauma than they were before they were exposed to trauma. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but but the, the caveat on that is they have to be handling the situation in a healthy way, right? So we need to give them those tools to do that. So officers can actually retire healthier than they were emotionally before they got on the job if, if they handle it the proper way. Yeah, and to piggyback on on uh, what Chris said, you know, it's they've got to realize this is this is multifaceted. It's not you can't do one thing and expect you know it's not it's not the the light switch. And frankly, uh, leadership at every level needs to put in the time and the effort to understand this and see what the agency needs to do because every one of them at every level of leadership has a responsibility. And so, for instance, you know, when we did this work with Oakland Police Department, we were able to get the command staff to commit to come in for a three hour training, right? And break all this stuff down that I talked about today, some of the stuff that both Justin and Chris talked about, all incredibly valid points that, that they need to hear. For most of those individuals, they've been on, you know, at, at that level, they've been on forever, right? <laughs> And they didn't get this stuff. And the training that the troops get, many times the upper echelon doesn't have to go to, right? And so they're not getting this insight and so forth. So they need to be there as much, if not more, than the officers who serve under them. That's the reality of it. So if they really, you know, they've got to give more than lip service. Part at the end, what I was saying about these leaders need to come around and see this and that, that's so that they can see where the rubber hits the road, so they can see the importance of this, so they can see where the research has brought us. I mean, if you want to give them an, an analogy, give them the analogy, I guarantee you, all three officers you see right here, the, the, the way that we now do CPR uh, out on the road is different now than it was when I came on in 1986. Why? It wasn't because we didn't have the intention to save lives back then. That's what we knew then. We know more now. That meant, and thus we've adjusted to how we are going to try to uh, save somebody's life who's in cardiac arrest, right? We, we've learned, we've changed methods and so forth. We got to do the same thing, thing here. We weren't having these conversations that we had today in 1986, right? And I, I guarantee you, Justin and Chris will tell you that when they first came on, we weren't having these conversations, right? Nobody was. So, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, Mr. Boardman. Thank you. <laughs> they can call me Justin. Um, so ditto on what um, they just said. I also think that um, when we look about at leadership, um, to become a chief of police these days, um, you have to work your way up the chain. And so when they finally get to that spot, they are usually between 15 and 20 years from patrol. And mm. they, the world has changed a lot since, um, you know, like Dave was out in patrol, you know, in 87 and 88, right? It has changed since then. Um, and so they've lost a little bit of touch. But I think that if we wanna look at this problem, we have all these issues with mental health and so on and so forth. And we wanna swim upstream a little bit to stop that. Um, we're, we as a profession 
um, respond to what's going on right now. We go out and put band-aids on stuff, but we need to solve it a little bit upstream so we don't have to do some of that. And what I mean about that would be more like this mindfulness and resiliency. So I talk about the neurobiology of trauma um, for victims and some for the police departments um, so that we can compare the two, but that's phase two. Phase one is this mindfulness and resiliency. And it might sound like hippie BS, but it's hippie BS that works. Um, I put it into practice. Right before I left the job, I was going to a bunch of different retreats for this. And I put the, the link in the chat to Mindful Badge. But I almost shot and killed a lady right before I left, two months before. The only reason she's alive today was this mindfulness and resiliency. So when we take a look at these questions over here, um, we look at how trauma affects law enforcement and what do we think we need to say to leadership. First off, um, mindfulness and resiliency helps bring down a lot of the implicit bias. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about bias to police officers, they say, I'm not racist, but it's, it's not that, it's, it's this implicit bias and um, history on top of that. We need to teach history in the academies, but we also need to get away from the hypervigilance training and do situational awareness, which is this mindfulness stuff. But it makes us healthier. It makes us mentally healthier, physically healthier. And so your health costs go down, your turnover goes down. It strengthens the police department. Um, and there's a lot of ways to practice that. So when it comes to right here, uh, it says police culture to get more officers to buy in. So we're looking at this mindfulness as actually being safer than the hypervigilance mm -hmm. um, training that we, we get. It's safer for our public, it's safer for us and we're healthier and we have a better situational awareness of what's occurring. So we're actually safer now. And that's how I think that you bring it to the police department stuff. Can I jump in on what Justin just said? Because I think it was such a good point. Oh, I thank you. Yeah. Uh, so he, he, when I went through the academy in 97, it was all, I mean, there was, there was um, death lurking around every corner. Every car was loaded with guns. And, <laughs> and right. I mean, and I understood why they did it because it is a dangerous job, right? There's no doubt. But the hypervigilance, I think sets you out there, um, you know, already at fight or flight, right, right there, ready. Primed for the fight for me. That that was my, you know, that's us. We can't. Flight's not an option for us. So it's fight, right? Absolutely. And so I do think that mindfulness allows us to be in the moment and to assess each situation as it comes up, right? And and the truth is that if I'm totally mindful and I'm in the moment, I'm feeling what's going on. I'm seeing what's going on. I'm reading the energy of people. I look what's going on. If I'm in that moment, I'm way safer than I am when I'm constantly overwhelmed, overloaded with this hypervigilance that was implanted in me in the police academy, because I cannot maintain that state of mind for any length of time. But I want to have an appropriate emotional response, appropriate physical response, appropriate uh, spiritual response, to be honest, to every incident that I'm in, right? So that was a really good point. And I think that as we introduce these things to law enforcement, we're going to be able to move more effectively to being the guardian who can be a warrior. I mean, that's, that's the truth is if I need to be, we can employ that at a moment's notice, but that's a, a last resort and we can, we can save that as last resort. So great point, Justin. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, you know, that goes to one thing we've stressed is, is Justin and, and, and Chris really alluded to is that we do a great job of teaching the hard skills. We don't do a real good job of teaching soft skills, right? And talking people, I spent a career talking people into handcuffs, you know? And I think both of these officers would also agree. I mean, Justin's already told us about it. We've had times in our career where we could have justified, we could have effectively mm -hmm. articulated deadly force, but we chose to do something else, mm -hmm. right? And so part of that is getting these individuals, one, to know that there, there are other options, two, not being, you know, 
danger is real, fear is a choice. And so, you know, the danger, it's what do we do with the danger? How have we been able to, how are we able to effectively uh, de-escalate and things and things and not make the danger more? Uh, fear is a healthy thing, but we have to, we have to be here, be in, in, in control of the fear. And then, you know, there's going to be times there absolutely are justified times where deadly force is necessary. Never going to say that there aren't, but there, <laughs> there are times when that option, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be something that's necessarily on the table. You know, sometimes we watch some of these videos and I'm like, why do they already have their gun out? You got that thing out. What the hell are you going to do with it before you even need it, right? I, I mean, and so it's like, do I, it, it, are we at a felony stop? <laughs> are we at that level already? You know, because, um, you know, our muscle memory and everything, because we practice it, we're going to be able to get that, that, that firearm out and so forth as quick as we need it, right? And so... There are so many things if we, you know, the way we train is what we do because in that, 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 uh, that, that situation, when the BAM comes, as Justin, I, I love that, when the BAM comes, we go to reflexes and, and, and muscle memory, right? The, the frontal cortex is offline. It's totally dark. Nothing's going on there, right? And so we can also, when we do these live scenarios, I worked at the academy for five years. You're like, right, we did nothing but kill rookies for six months. Right? And so you're so hyper vigilant about these things. It's no wonder sometimes officers go up with that. That's what, that's how we've trained them. Um, but we, we also started doing this thing called dealing with people, which starts helps them to develop those soft skills we didn't do enough of it now that i think back to it we didn't do enough of it but there's ways to develop the soft skills also and to teach the individual to be a, a totally rounded uh police officer and you definitely i think trauma-informed you know if you want to talk people into doing things in a trauma-informed way talk to them about how you want to be treated if you get into a shooting if we're, we're going to want to talk to officers Talk about how, you know, we, we talk about giving them one or two sleep cycles. Do you know in the 50s, we had officers being fired for lying after a shooting because they were given a statement right after the shooting. Then the next day they'd come back and change something and then they, they'd be accused of lying and they'd get fired, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why in most agencies, you get the information you re need right away, but they wait one or two sleep cycles before they do that critical interview, right? And there's a reason for, we've learned by critical incidents how memory works. We need to apply the same thing to the citizens we serve, and we need to we we need to recognize when we explain trauma, like Justin did, and we define it and we lay it out and show that every one of us is susceptible to it, and every one of us, you can think that you're you know the, the, this individual who's invincible and everything, but you know what? When survival brain takes over, you may want rational brain to be working, but it's offline. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the, the, the power going out and everything just. So, uh, you know, a lot of these things are, are taking the time to explain it. So people, you know, like in Philadelphia, Denzel Washington, explain it to me like I'm a five year old. Right. So people can really grasp it and understand it. And once they do. I, I think they're able to to uh, to, to react and to, to start to see why we need to go in a different direction in some aspects of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you train hypervigilance and we're going to die on every corner, you know, that's been taught for generations. So it gets more intense with each generation of officers. But when we teach hypervigilance, hypervigilance is... PTSD, it's one of those things in PTSD. And we get taught how to survive with hypervigilance. Then we're given a gun and we're told to be social workers. And this is what's kind of what's been happening, you know, so. Right, and, and the, the knock-on effect is that, so, you know, I don't, I don't know how many, what percentage of police officers die in line of duty, right, or by gunshot or, or felonious assault of other sort. 
but the percentage that die as a result of stress-related illness, uh, you know, heart disease, alcoholism, all this stuff. That I, I saw a study by um, I can share this link too that showed Buffalo PD were very similar to Cleveland and a lot of the other de departments online here had a had a life expectancy of 22 years shorter than 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 the average. And so that's that is the danger to police that we need to really start addressing right there. We're going to ask, like Art saying, we're so depleted. We're going to ask them to go out there and do all this stuff, and not provide them the tools, the recognition that the real occupational hazard is trauma and stress, and stress-related illness, even more so than gunshots. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, and thank thank you all so much for such really thoughtful and robust um, ways in which you approach approach that question. I think you know folks have really uh, learned a lot, and we, we've got a couple of more questions in the queue I want to get to. Um, this person, I believe, uh, posted this question during, um, I believe it was Mr. Thomas's section, um, but they were referencing something that I believe De Detective Boardman said, um, and they said, Detective Boardman mentioned the body memory that leads an officer to reach for their weapon and the choice of a weapon that doesn't require fine motor skills. And now hearing 19% of police experience PTSD. Given how many police shootings there are, particularly of black and brown people, is this something police are rethinking from a trauma perspective? Absolutely. Um, I think we kind of touched it a minute ago um, with the mindfulness and resiliency um, going upstream to, um, to train on that. Um, I think the implicit bias stuff is very interesting, especially since I've left um, law enforcement. I, I policed in the West um, and we were not the most diverse by any means, shape or form. And I grew up in the eighties when we were afraid of all these California gangsters moving to Utah and they would show people on the news and being arrested. And we started stereotyping in the back of our head, way back here in that defense circuitry, right? Um, and that's when I started to get out on patrol, I was starting to interact with people that I saw on the news when I was a kid growing up, when gangster rap was coming out, we were afraid of all this sort of stuff. I, I grew up in privilege and all of that programmed back in here. When I got taught hypervigilance, that escalated it. So when I got to the mindfulness and more of the situational awareness, it took a lot of that implicit bias away. But on top of that, I have been blessed um, with my career to be training a lot um, in Alabama and um, those places around there and spending a lot of time in Montgomery and getting policing history. I would sit there in the Equal Justice Initiative Museum and just be at awe going, oh my gosh, the mistakes that I've made and my thought process, we don't get the history. And in Utah, I didn't even know there was a Northern migration when I went through high school. I knew that there was a Mormon migration west to Utah, but I didn't know about any of the other. And learning about the history, I think helps bring down some of the implicit bias, as well as we're learning this trauma and the neurobiology of trauma, but generational and community trauma is also something we don't understand. We know that domestic violence will go generation to generation, but we need to put that on a bigger scale and know about the generation and the generational and community trauma of Native America and of Black America. I didn't get that. Um, and I think that's where um, our police academies have failed. I'm also a thought that we need a federal system of just basic police training that would go to different, that would be in each state. And then we would add stuff onto that. So because Florida doesn't need avalanche rescue where Utah might, but we don't have a core and a and a multidisciplinary team of people building that core curriculum that should be sp spread out. 
that's another soapbox. I seem to kind of trip on them here and there. Well, that was such a, again, you all come with such wisdom and thoughtfulness. And uh, I think that really answered that person's question. Our next question, and we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna pose this last question to the, the esteemed panelists. Um, how do you think we can address police culture to get more officers to buy into strategies that might help them, like through mindfulness, counseling, peer support? Um, and then I think there was another one that tied into that. Um, no, I think that was it. There was one last question that I think you all talked on a little bit around, should officers get a refresher course or check up um, to deal with some of that, um, uh, not being on the, the beat path and uh, moving through, but I think you all may have answered that. So let's end on that last question around what can we do to help change the mindset around being trauma-informed and, and informing police culture? <clears throat> I, I tell you, I think one of the best ways is to not only uh, address it through, you know, the official ways that we normally do things, but the unofficial ways that we, we got a lot of unofficial leaders uh, in police departments. You know, every shift has the, 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 the guy or the girl that everybody listens to. Get buy-in from them and the others will follow, mm -hmm. right? Um, this isn't rocket science. This is addition and subtraction. And bring, pull them aside and really lay it out like we're laying this stuff out here to them. Uh, make it relative to what they've done. You know, I always say, I like to, when, when I do training or anything, I wanna make it that person's idea to change their mind, not me to come and shove something down their throat. And so that means I've gotta come in with my bags packed and ready to give to, to provide answers for them to questions before they even ask the question, right? And so I, I try to get in, you know, get in and get the buy-in from, from those influence individuals, especially the unofficial ones, and then, and realize this is also, this is not a flip of a switch. This is a process, but, you know, start small. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm sure these guys heard no matter what you teach at the academy, when you get to your FTO, forget everything you learned in the academy, I'm gonna teach you how to be the real police. We have to influence those individuals also because mm -hmm. they have the first shot of molding this clay that comes out of the academy, right? This too is multifaceted. So we've got to have leadership, the official leadership on board, which means they have to attend training like everybody else. You know, they're not omnipresent. We have to have we have to bring the unofficial leaders in, um, get them on board, and then this has to be ongoing, like brushing your teeth, once again. This has to be something we continue to work on, we continue to massage, we continue to, to pay attention to. Like I, well, on one of my slides, what we pay attention to grows. And so we have to put in the time and the effort to make it grow. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was the approach that we took too, was to, uh, you know, reach out to maybe some of the Downing Thomas Thomases, but people with street credibility, for sure, get them on board, um, invite them in to participate. And once they participate and enjoy it, and, and they're the advocates, they're the best advocates, you know, that, that I totally agree with that. But also getting the leadership on board. Our command staff, about 60% of our command staff has joined us for Mindfulness Day of training. And we're going to, we're going to do it again um, and, and just, just to really get that buy-in from the top as well. So both, yeah, great point. Wonderful. So we have about two minutes left. I don't know if anyone has any closing thoughts. If not, well, give people two minutes back of their day. Um, and we just want to thank all of our esteemed, like I said, panelists, you all just bring such good wisdom and expertise to the space. And so we're very grateful for your, for your being here today. For those of you who joined us, be on the lookout. You'll get an email with the uh, PowerPoint information, recording, and any other resources like uh, Mr. Thomas uh, mentioned earlier with his YouTube link. 
so that you can um, have access to that later. Uh, if you have any other questions about the uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods, you can go to uh, our website to learn more about how you can receive training and technical assistance, just like what you received today. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. The email is listed there in on the PowerPoint slide. Thank you all very much and have a good rest of your day and a beautiful weekend. Thank you. Thanks. All right, be safe, everybody.